everyone. May I remind you, members, please, that these proceedings are being recorded. Can we take the notice convening the meeting as read? Read. The next item is the minutes of the meeting of the Council held on the 21st of November. Can we agree the minutes of the meeting of the 21st November 2018? Read. Members have been asked to display their declarations of interest on the board at the entrance to the chamber. Do any members have any further declarations? I have some announcements to make. It is with great sadness that I refer to the death earlier this month of former councillor leader, council leader Robert Simmons, aged 69 years. Bob spent six years as leader from May 2002 to May 2008. He represented the Town End Farm Board from 1988 until 2004, when this changed to be Castle Ward, which he represented until 2010. During his leadership, Bob oversaw a series of projects, including the Sunderland Aquatic Centre, Building Schools for the Future programme, and the signing of the Friendship Agreement between Sunderland and the US capital, Washington, DC. Bob served on numerous council committees, including the Cabinet, Personnel Committee, Education, Environment, Housing, Public Health, and Social Services Committees. He represented the council on a number of outside bodies during his tenure as leader, including the Association of Northeast Councils, the Local Government Association, Newcastle International Airport, and Northeast Regional Employees Organization. Bob also served as a school governor at Bexhill, Hastings Hill, and Townend Farm for many years before becoming a former company member, director, and chair of Wise Academies which leads a series of schools across the region, including the above schools I've mentioned. Bob was awarded an OBE last June in the Queen's Birthday Honours List for his services to education. Bob worked hard for our city, both as a councillor and council leader, and cared deeply about Sunderland and our residents. It is also with sadness that I mention the death of Lord Derek Foster of Bishop Auckland, who died on the 5th of January, aged 81 years in Sunderland Hospital. Derek Foster was born in Sunderland, son of a shipyard fitter. From Bede Grammar School, he won a place at Oxford University, gradu graduating with a BA in Philosophy, Politics and Economics. He was first elected to Sunderland Borough Council in 1972 for St Chad's Ward, and then in 1973 he was elected to serve on the Tyne and Weir County Council as a representative of the Downhill Ward. From 1974 to 1976, he was Chair of the North of England Development Council. Derek became Assistant Director of Education for Sunderland Borough Council in 1974, until his election as MP for Bishop Auckland in 1979. He spent 10 years as Labour Chief Whip and was very closely associated with the modernisation efforts of the leader Neil Kinnock. Derek Foster stood down from the House of Commons at the 2005 elections and was appointed to the House of Lords, becoming a life peer. He was passionate about the North East and remained deeply involved across the region. He was a member of the Salvation Army and his funeral was held last week in Millfield at the Salvation Army headquarters in Rutland Street in Sunderland. Finally, I must inform Council of the death of Mr Frank Major, former Port of Sunderland manager, who passed away aged 74 years on the 9th of October. Frank was general manager of the Port of Sunderland until he retired in 2005 after 45 years of service in the ports and the shipping industry. Frank received an MBE for his services to flood and coastal erosion, risk management in 2013, having been the chair of the Northumbria Regional Flood and Coastal Committee of the Environment Agency since 2003. Frank was a magistrate from 1992 and took the role of Deputy Lieutenant of Tyne and Weir in 2007. He was a previous chairman of the North East England Nature Partnership. Frank also had a number of roles for voluntary organisations, including the Scouts and the Royal National Lifeboat Institution. 
Will you please all join me in sending deepest condolences to the families and former friends of Councillor Leader Bob Simmons, Lord Derek Foster and Mr Frank Major. I would therefore ask you all to stand for a minute's silence as a mark of respect. Please be seated. That concludes my announcements. The next item is the reception of petitions. Do any members have petitions to present? to install railings around the footpaths on the Nagels Road at Grindon Infant School in order to improve safety for the children attending, uh, excuse me, attending there. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you very much. Yeah. Councillor Samuels. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Mayor. <coughs> Petitioner here from English Mark, there's a primary school signed by 179 residents. So it's really undersigned. Our teachers, staff, parents, carers, and families of pupils attending English Mark, this primary school, and residents living in the surrounding area. Following long standing concerns about the safety of children arriving at and leaving the school during the high speeds at which cars travel on the road, and the recent serious accident in November 2018 where a 10 year old child was hit by a car and had to be airlifted to the hospital with severe injuries, we are calling on the council to urgently look to implement road safety measures on Red Road to protect our children. Thank you. Thank you, <coughs> Councillor Samuels. Can we agree to refer these to the appropriate chief officers? Do we have any apologies for absence? Yes, Madam Mayor, we have apologies from councillors Davison, D. Dixon, Heron, D. McKnight, P. Walker, Watson, D. Wilson, Williams, Scaplehorn, and Alderman Arnott, Forbes, and Greenfield. Thank you. Are there any further apologies that members wish to note? Thank you very much indeed. Yes. <coughs> Councillor Paul Hunt. Any others? No, that's it. Thank you very much indeed. The next item is uh, questions by members of the public. I will read these questions out and uh, they will be answered by the appropriate officers. The first question is from Mr IWK and the question is as follows. Following recent accidents involving children outside the English Martyrs and Northern Saints School, could the leader provide an update on the proposed council plans for an extensive 20 mile per hour for Red House and surrounding areas of North Sunderland? That would be answered by Councillor Amy Wilson. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And I'd like to thank Mr Kay for his question. A 20 mile an hour zone has been proposed for the Red House area, which includes the carriageway outside English Mortis School. The scheme also covers Town End Farm, Downhill, Hilton Castle, Witherwack and Marley Ponds. 
During the council's engagement process, concerns were raised by a bus operator that the introduction of the scheme will result in increased transit time and as such will have a significant, de a significant detriment effect on the ability to provide reliable, timely, attractive and sustainable public transport operations in the city. To alleviate the bus operator's concerns and to remove the potential for a formal objection, objection to the scheme, officers have been developing bus stop improvements throughout the 20 mile hour zone to counteract any detrimental impact on bus services. A meeting between officers and the bus operator is due to be held on the 7th of February to discuss the scheme and subject to resolving the bus operator's concerns and no formal objections being received during the statutory legal process it is hoped that implementation will commence in May 2019. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Wilson. Question two. Question two is from Craig McFarlane. Does the leader think spending £16,000 to jet off to China gives the right impression of his caring for the community he is meant to serve whilst cutting vital public services? Leader? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, Mr McFarlane, you really do need to have a quiet word with your source of information. £16,000, really? Your source is clearly rubbish or very poor at arithmetic. The total cost for my visit to China in January was £3,030. In today's global economy, it is essential for Sunderland, like other cities, to engage in the wider world and send a clear message that we are open for business. This forms part of a balanced approach which is important for the Council in seeking to serve Sunderland's communities and their needs. The visit in January enabled Sunderland to be represented at the International Sister Cities Symposium where 24 cities and city regions alongside Sunderland uh, got together in Harbin and take part in the Mayor's Roundtable with senior representatives from those cities and city regions. It allowed us to introduce the city and its strengths within this forum, as well as sharing experience on international engagement and opportunities that would come forward from it. Sunderland has a friendship agreement with Harbin, which was signed in 2009. This partnership is set within the context of the citywide international strategy, which focuses on generating benefits for the city's economy and businesses its people and communities and its brand and reputation. I do believe that investing £3,030 and five days of my time at the start of January was a wise investment and that Sunderland will continue to benefit commercially from our global engagement strategy. And by the way, it is nine years of austerity introduced by the Feb Dems and Tories in coalition in 2010 that has resulted in over £290 million of cuts to this council's budget. This council is delivering what it can with the money it has left, so blame the Tories and Feb Dems for the cuts, not this Labour council. And in closing, Sunderland currently has 25,106 jobs in 85 internationally owned companies originating in 20 different territories and during the last five years we have secured over 4,000 jobs and capital investment totaling 533.2 million from overseas com companies because the business investment team and occasionally the leader goes overseas and talks to countries and businesses who want to do business with us and I think £3,030 was very well spent indeed, Madam Mayor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Leader. Question three from Richard Bradley. I believe that Sunderland Council's waste management programme is failing the city with financial and environmental consequences we can ill afford. However, the op opposition parties are silent on this matter and the portfolio holder disagrees. Therefore, can Councillor Wilson give me one government statistic on waste she is proud of and where Sunderland is better than the national average? Thank you, Councillor Wilson. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And I'd like to thank Richard for his question. A statistic that Sunderland Council can be proud of and is better than the regional average 
is that we only send 0.5% of our waste to landfill. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Wilson. Question from Rachel Lowe. The recent IPCC report gave the world only 12 years to take the decisive action necessary to avoid a climate disaster. Labour councils such as London, Manchester and Bradford have all declared a climate emergency and we have committed to being carbon neutral by 2030. And th sorry, they have committed to being carbon neutral by 2030. Will Sunderland Council do the same? Councillor Mordy. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Madam Mayor, tackling climate change is a key priority for the Council in our emerging city plan and we currently have an aspiration to be carbon neutral by 2030. We recognise the impact of climate change and the challenges that it brings and have recently published our carbon plan which outlines the activity we will undertake to reduce carbon emissions in order to meet the targets as set out in the UK Climate Change Act. We are working with partners to identify additional measures to reduce the impact of CO2 emissions. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Mordi. Question from Dom Armstrong. The desire to save our green belt engaged thousands of residents but didn't change the local plan at all. Why did the council choose to dismiss the opinion of those it's supposed to be representing? Councillor Porthouse. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And can I thank Dom Armstrong? <coughs> Question, Madam Mayor. Um, Mr. Armstrong is wrong. Absolutely wrong. This council did not choose to dismiss the opinions of those it represents. Quite the opposite. Mr. Dom Armstrong, the local candidate for the Green Party, has his facts completely wrong. The Council have taken into consideration all representations, including all issues raised by residents submitted to the Council on the core strategy and development plan, and has published a schedule of representations which summarise the issues raised in the Council's response. The Council at this stage can only propose minor modifications to the plan which are identified in the schedule of modifications. All representations have been submitted to the planning inspector for his consideration and he could identify further modifications he requires to make the plan sound during the examination in public. Any such modifications will be consulted on later this year. All documents referred to are available on the Council's website, Madam Mayor. Furthermore, can I also add that there's only 3% of the green belt was proposed to be removed, which entailed 15 sites. Following consultation, four were removed, the remaining sites representing approximately 2% of the original green belt. The sites removed were Glebe House Farm in Washington, often in Shining Roar Ward, and I think it's Perth Hall in Springwell, and of course West Park in Middle Harrington. Furthermore, Madam Mayor, the plan now protects <coughs> large swathes of open countryside which was designated white land. Some of those sites are land in the Het and Easington Lane areas, large areas surrounding Tunstall Hills, sites in Washington, and of course a little known field called the Wishing Well Field in Councillor Blackett's office which I believe in November they voted against the plan. So basically voting against this plan was endorsing developers to come along and choose sites which are now protected. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Porthouse. Next question from Rachel Featherston. Last week the Sunderland Echo reported that 2,000 people are waiting for social housing, particularly bungalows. Would the council pledge to make providing these homes a priority rather than the wholly unnecessary executive homes they plan on the green belt? Again, Councillor Porthouse, over to you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And can I thank Rachel Featherstone for her question? The core strategy and development plan will require developments of 10 units above, the, above across the city to deliver 15% as affordable homes. At present, it's only 10%. The Council has worked with a number of partners to ensure that affordable homes in balance is addressed. Furthermore, Madam Mayor, we must not forget it was the Tory party who introduced the right to buy, 
consequently removing large numbers of social affordable housing from the rented sector market. Thank you, Madam Mayor. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Portas. The next question is from Heather Fagan, Care Workers. In recent months, the Council... Sorry. In recent months, the Council have enforced their third-party contracts within the adult care to introduce a telephone check-in service which involves care workers to report in when they arrive and leave a service user's home. This means that care workers do not get paid for any travelling time between each visit. Hence, they could work a 12-hour day, yet only get paid for eight. Can the Council explain how this aligns with the ethos of their great job motion? Councillor Dr Walker. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and thanks to Ms Fagan for asking this question. Mm -hmm. I'm glad to have the precedence before the next question, where Councillor Kelly gets the opportunity to talk about the very important question of the Spice Girl concert. <coughs> uh, if I can just clarify the situation as it stands at the moment, the Council has introduced a new way of quality monitoring commissioned home care visits into people's homes by the implementation of an electronic call monitoring system called CM2000. Home care providers are in agreement with the principles and implementation of the system, and this system enables both the council and providers to inform a more accurate picture of the volume of care that is required to meet the customer's needs and support their safety and well-being. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you very much, Councillor Dr Walker. Counts, uh, next question from Amy Jane Humble. Following the news that the council will be providing financial assistance to the stadium to host the Spice Girls, can the Council assure the public that individual councillors will not be benefiting from any gifts, kind of gifts from the stadium, such as free ticket VIP boxes for the same said concert? Over to you, Councillor Kelly. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'm, I'm resisting all the temptations and all the requests I've had to say certain uh, Spice Girl lines, and we'll just get on with the answer. Can I thank um, Amy June Noble for question Madam Mayor. Council is proud to support cultural events across the city uh, and the forthcoming concert of the Stadium of Light is just one of a raft of events that help Sunderland, uh, help put Sunderland on the map as a destination city with events at, heart, at its heart. The increased visitors will bring a benefit to local economy that in turn benefit residents and communities. I can't confirm Madam Mayor, I have not had an invite to the Spice Girls, I have not got a VIP box and to the best of my knowledge, none of my colleagues have either. No, I haven't either, thank you. <laughs> I don't want one. <laughs> thank you very much indeed, Councillor Kelly. <laughs> and that concludes the questions. We now move on. We now move on to the report of the Cabinet. Can I call upon the Leader to move the approval and adoption of the report of the Cabinet? I so move, Madam Mayor. Deputy Leader, do you second the report? I second the report, Madam Mayor, reserve the right to speak. Leader, if you would like to speak to the Cabinet report. Madam Mayor, the three items are fully laid out and uh, I just need it to go forward as that. Thank you very much. Would anyone else like to speak to the report? Councillor Oliver? Councillor Dixon? Councillor Oliver? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, just a brief uh, comment and question on items one and, uh, and two. On the council tax base item one, it does make clear that the council tax base in this city is very heavily concentrated in uh, council tax A and B properties and along with them a high level of, of discounts. And of course, I see Councillor Miller complaining in the newspaper today about local government funding, but of course this is one of the problems when the council tax base is so small and the central government uh, grant is cut, then those authorities that have very small council tax bases uh, are going to lose out. So we are where we are with it, but it does mean that it is very, very important that this city in the future does have executive housing and does have housing in higher, in higher bands. We had 398 new houses last year I'd be interested to know if the leader has got the information tonight or maybe later, what bans those 398 
uh, houses fall into and therefore what increase in council tax revenue we have had over the last year. And secondly, on, on item two, the local uh, council tax support scheme, um, uh, I notice on this that it is uh, required that pensioners are, are protected, but it's not clear whether the other criteria in it is um, demanded by, um, by central government or not, such as, for example, the two-child limit which has been introduced in line with national welfare reform. So I'd be grateful if you made that clear whether that's entirely a choice of this council or whether that's been done uh, because it's been demanded by central government. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Dixon. <coughs> Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I'd like just to refer to council tax empty property premium, and just basically say that we are um, very pleased that the council is taking this on. It, it's uh, legislation from the uh, the Conservative government, and I think it's good legislation to um, increase the extra uh, empty rate from 50% to to 100 add on. Um, however, a question, if I may. Um, I was talking to somebody involved in local government in, in the Midlands uh, on empty properties and some people were worried that it might apply to those houses that were empty for legitimate reasons, long term medical care, uh, people being placed in old people's homes etc. And I would like an assurance that those sort of people would be treated much more differently and distinguished from private landlords who, who are leaving their properties empty. Thank you. Councillor Mordi, did you wish to speak? No, thank you, Madam Mayor. Leader, thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, Councillor Dixon, I have no idea if there's any distinction from your Conservative government's legislation, but I'll ask the Connect Officer and get a response to you if that's OK. Uh, Councillor Oliver, uh, I once again have absolutely no idea how many of those homes are in what band. So I'll make sure that you get that information sent to me tomorrow, if that's all right. And regarding the council tax scheme issues, that's probably best as a discussion with Joan Reid, if that's OK. And I'll make sure that officer speaks with you tomorrow as well, because once again, I'm unsure on that answer, and I don't want to say the wrong thing to you, Robert, if that's OK. Thank you very much indeed, Leader. So do we accept the report of the Cabinet? Very, very we now turn to written questions by members of the Council. First question is from Councillor Stephen Foster and will be answered by Councillor Paul Stewart. Councillor Foster. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Madam Mayor, could the leader update Council on the recent cyber attack on our IT systems in November 2018, which appeared to be part of a sustained attack on some local authorities? by external forces. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Can I first of all thank uh, Councillor Foster for providing uh, us the question. Um, the Council suffered a distributed denial of service, get that right, DDoS attack in November 2018, which is where the perpetrator seeks to make a machine or a network resource unavailable to its intended users by temporarily or indefinitely disrupting services of a host connected to the internet. The attack commenced at approximately 10 a.m., at which point the ITC servers severed the Council's external links to protect all IT services and ensure all internal systems could continue to operate as normal. The ITC servers worked very closely with the Council's internet service provider and a mitigation was quickly configured to implement and implemented to absorb the attack before it reached us. At approximately 3 p.m., the internet connection was re-established and all services returned to normal. The IT service worked closely with the National Cyber Security Centre and followed us all guidance to protect the council from cyber attack and maintain good cyber hygiene. A report was recently taken to Scrutiny Coordinating Committee on the 17th of January 2019, which summarises the position regarding recent IT activity and confirms that IT controls that are in place are strong and are subject to ongoing review. 
In relation to the DDoS attack that took place in Sunderland, it's interesting uh, to refer to the fact that uh, in the, the, the few weeks preceding that, both Newcastle, Stockton, Manchester and Bedford councils were also uh, attacked. Um, and these councils were offline substantially longer than Sunderland. This was the first occasion where Sunderland uh, had suffered a, a significant DDoS at attack and the downtime was relatively short. And I'd like to take the opportunity, uh, Madam Mayor, to, to thank the staff that were involved in ensuring that uh, we've got robust systems in place in Sunderland and that it was a job well done. But I would say it's a, a, that it's a welcome reminder, I think, to all of us, and particularly elected members, to always be vigilant <coughs> while we're online. Thanks, Chair. Thank you very much for that detailed reply. Question two, Councillor Robert Francis, and it will be answered by Councillor Stuart Porthouse. Thank you, Madam Mayor. At the last full meeting of Council, we were promised a deep dive into the redevelopment of the Seaburn Sea Front. Can the portfolio holder tell us what progress has been made, with special reference being made to the works to be undertaken north of Dyckman's Road. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, Madam Mayor, it wasn't at the last full meeting of council, it was the September meeting, when the deputy lady gave that assurance, just for information. But thank you, Councillor Francis, for the prior question. At the September meeting of full council, um, Siglion were asked to com commence the review of the deep dive, well, I'm never certain what actually deep dive means, of the proposed redevelopments of Seaburn. Since then, Siglion has again been reviewing what market demand there is to deliver a greater quantum of leisure uses at the seafront. Once the demand is understood, a program of investments will then be considered for approval. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, gentlemen. <coughs> third question is from Councillor Stephen O'Brien. The question reads, can the leader confirm how many young people who are EU nationals are currently in our care system or receiving council support and what is our strategy for assisting them? Um, Councillor Farthing. <coughs> thank you Madam Mayor and thank Councillor O'Brien for prior notice of the question. I was tempted to respond to his email last week to suggest that he'd asked the wrong question or possibly asked it a little prematurely because, like most of us in this room, I believe I am an EU citizen. I certainly have an EU passport and I won't stop being an EU citizen until I believe the 29th of March or possibly even later, depending on what happens in Parliament. So. <laughs> The question that you've asked, I assume that you wanted to know about non-UK uh, EU residents, but you didn't ask that, so I don't have that information. So thank you, Madam Mayor. Question four. <laughs> Councillor O'Neill and Councillor Graham Miller, the leader, will reply. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Would the leader wish to comment on the recent report by the United Nations which confirmed that the austerity programme enacted since 2010 by Liberal Democrats and Tory governments continues to fall disproportionately upon the poor, women, racial and ethnic minorities, children, single parents and people with disabilities. In addition, the deliberate changes to taxes and benefits since 2010 have been highly regressive and the policies have taken the highest toll on those least able to bear it. Would he agree with me that the parties responsible should be condemned for deliberately inflicting poverty on around a fifth of the whole population many now destitute and unable to afford the very basics for life, as evidenced in the report. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor O'Neill, uh, for the question. 
I understand that Councillor O'Neill is referring to the report from Philip Oxton, who was appointed by the United Nations to look at poverty in the UK. That's poverty in the UK, the UK that's got the fifth largest economy in the world. We're talking poverty in the UK. I'll say it again, poverty in the UK when we're the fifth largest economy in the world. Amazing. His, he, he issued his report in November and I understand that he will re 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 present this to the United Nations Human Rights Council later this year. For the benefit of members in the chamber who have not seen this report, he concluded that about 14 million British people, as Councillor O'Neill pointed out, a fifth of the population now live in poverty. Further, he identified that about 1.5 million people are destitute and that they are unable to afford basic essentials on a daily basis. He was citing figures from the Institute for Fiscal Studies and the Joseph Rowntree Foundation. He highlighted predictions that child poverty could worsen even more, rising by seven percentage points between 2015 and 2022, and possibly ending up at a rate of about 40%. 40% of our children potentially in child poverty in the fifth richest economy in the world. His report covered topics such as austerity, which had brought misery to many, the impact of universal credit, which required an overhaul, or it just requires getting rid of, as it was not delivering its intended principles, how the social safety net was no longer working, following cuts to local authority budgets at a time of rising social care demand, the impact of a digitalised welfare state, which excluded those people who did not have access or skills to use technology, and how changes to taxes and benefits have taken the highest toll on those least able to bear it. It is telling that he felt compelled to state that in the UK, poverty is a political choice. Austerity is a political choice. That political choice was made by the coalition government in 2010, when the Fib Dems and Tories delivered austerity as a political tool to attack Northern Labour councils and the poorest, those least able, to look after themselves. In the fifth richest economy in the world, which we're rightly proud of, we have food banks, increased poverty, destitution, increases in homelessness and rough sleeping, increases in suicide, child poverty on the rise, and meanwhile, the rich get richer, the poor get poorer, and we all pay for it. So, the fifth richest economy in the world, Mr. Alston's report, I think, states where we actually are, Austerity is to blame, so let's blame the Liberal Democrats and the Tories in this chamber because it's their combined government that started that process in 2010 and nine years later we're still dealing with the ongoing effects of it. And Councillor O'Neill, everything you said in your question was correct. Thank you very much for asking it. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you very much. Question five is by Councillor Peter Wood and we were responded to by Councillor Amy Wilson. Councillor Wood. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Does the Council have any plans to introduce a work pl workplace parking levy in the city? Thank you, Madam Mayor, and I'd like to thank Councillor Peter Wood for his question. The Council has no plans at present to introduce a workspace parking levy in the city. However, Cabinet recently consulted on its draft budget for 2019-20 Council will be aware that one of the proposals under consideration was in relation to parking charges for Sunderland City Council staff. This is a separate item to that referred to in the question, but I am highlighting this to avoid any confusion. The Cabinet will consider the final budget proposals on the 30th of February before they come to Council on the 6th of March. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you very much indeed. Question six will be read by Councillor Niall Hodson and answered by Councillor G. Wilson. <laughs> Mine says Councillor Wilson, so it must be Leader. Sorry, Leader. If you put it high, the more of you would have done. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor.
Councillor Hodson. Thank you. Um, Mayor Sunderland, uh, uh, a representative from the North East Chamber of Commerce recently made clear to a council committee and the local media how damaging a no deal Brexit would be to Sunderland. What representations has the council leadership made to the government to make clear the impact no deal would have on the economy of the city? And what representations has the council leadership made to avoid a no deal outcome? Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Hodgson, for assuming that this Labour group has the power to do any of that, but it's very much appreciated that you have faith in us. For some time, council members and officers have been working in depth on the impacts of Brexit and have played a key role in the North East Brexit Group, which was formed following the decision to leave the EU back in 2016. The group provides a collective single voice to contribute to and influence the ongoing national dialogue around Brexit. It is made up of members from business representative organisations, the education sector, trade unions, local authorities including ourselves, the North East Local Enterprise Partnership and voluntary organisations. The group has monitored and prepared evidence about the potential impact of Brexit scenarios, including no deal and related economic issues, incorporating evidence, views, experiences and responses of business, education and other organisations in the North East region to ensure that a clear and coordinated North East voice is heard. As part of this, the group has published a response to the Migration Advisory Committee call for evidence published a key messages statement on what our regional priorities are to inform Brexit negotiations, published a meta-analysis of reports and studies examining the impact of Brexit on the North East economy and its key sectors, responded to the APPG inquiry into post-Brexit funding, specifically the UK Shared Prosperity Fund, and supported the development of the Brexit toolkit available on the North East Growth, Growth Hub website. Sunderland, through the Deputy Leader, also leads on Brexit planning for the National Key Cities Group and organised a Beyond Brexit concert conference in the autumn, which was designed to air and bring the implications of Brexit on the key cities to the government's attention. I'm not sure what more we could do. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you very much indeed. Question 7. <coughs> Councillor Laughlin to be replied to by Councillor Dr Geoffrey Walker. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Winter in the festive period can be an especially lonely time for many residents in Sunderland. Could the leader explain what steps the council has undertaken to tackle loneliness and social isolation? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, and thanks to uh, Councillor Lachlan for forming the notice of the question and giving me the opportunity to share the response with the council. First of all, the Council, through its adult social care services, engages with over 6,000 people aged 18 years and above. Of course, some of these individuals will experience loneliness and isolation. Also, the Council, in its work with the social care sector in the city, provides a range of services that are aimed at relieving loneliness and social isolation for both individuals and carers. These services include home care service, where carers actively engage with individuals in their own homes, assisting with daily living tasks, and providing companionship and social interaction. In addition to this, personal assistance are available to help people access services in the community, helping people to go out of their homes and engage in community activity. In terms of the voluntary community sector in the city, they are also active in providing services to and contacting people by arranging people pay visits to people's homes, providing building-based service that people can access and also keeping in touch with people by telephone and social media. Sunderland so has a very active carer centre and arrangements for providing information, advice and guidance to carers and helping them to engage with other carers and coach, encouraging social interaction. Most councillors will be familiar with uh, social isolation and loneliness projects in their own areas through the work of their area committees, of course. The council, through its work with Sunderland College, has an intergenerational work programme in place whereby students who are studying health and social care programmes undertake work experience into extra care and residential group living arrangements, engaging directly with residents, encouraging social interaction through conversation and activities. This to date has been very successful and received national recognition. Thank you, Madam Mayor. 
Thank you very much indeed. The next question is Councillor Peter Wood and will be answered by <coughs> Councillor Michael Mordy. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Traffic congestion at the roundabout immediately south of the Weirmouth Bridge is already a problem. The dual carriageway linking Northern Spire with St Mary's Boulevard is due for completion in 2021. What plans are there for the completion of the dual carriageway to the port and how will congestion at the roundabout be tackled? Thank you, Madam Mayor. As part of the Northern Gateway project <coughs> around Dean Dorothy Street and North Bridge Street, there will be some amendments to the Southern Bridgehead Junction that will assist with tra existing traffic issues which sometimes occur at this location during the peak hour periods. Madam Mayor, the Council will continue to progress the development of Phase 5 of the SSTC project from Bridge Street to Commercial Road, leading to the port which includes a number of junction improvements and a full dueling of West Weir Street. We will, we will continue to look for funding opportunities to deliver the scheme and are currently developing proposals in line with the DFT and Transport for the North major road network funding streams. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you very much. Next question, Councillor Martin Haswell, will be answered by Councillor John Kelly. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, in light of the recent news for people manufacturing Spice Girls merchandise for comic relief, are earning as little as 35 pence an hour, and working in appalling conditions. Will the leader commit to engaging with the events organiser for the upcoming concert at the Stadium Light and ask that they ensure that official merchandise sold at the event has been manufactured ethically? Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Can I go ahead and thank as well for the question in advance? The Council ensures its own employees earn their living wage and fully support initiatives that seek to achieve this for others. We cannot influence how the Spice Girls and Comic Relief merchandise is manufactured, unfortunately, but yes, we will certainly question the organisation around their policies. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Kelly. Council, uh, question 10, <coughs> Councillor Harry Truman, to be answered by the leader. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Will the leader wish to comment on the current industrial dispute between Arriva Rail North and the RMT that has resulted in around 40 days of strike action taking place since March in 2017. Will you agree with me that this dispute is politically motivated by government's interference <coughs> in the commercial business of Arriva Rail North by requiring the introduced driver controlled operations on at least 50% of northern services? Madam Mayor, and uh, thank you, Councillor Truman, for the question. And I do agree with you. Uh, but it's not only you, Councillor Truman, it's not only me, it's not only the Labour Group, it's Barry White, the Chief Executive of Transport for the North, who says that. And I'll just read you one paragraph from his letter that was sent out regarding this position on the 27th of November 2018. Reposition on ongoing industrial action on the network operated by Northern. Transport for the North does not support removing the second person from trains, particularly when a significant proportion of rail stations in the north of England are classed as inaccessible for disabled passengers. So it is clearly a politically motivated stunt by the government to put pressure on the unions and their workers to accept uh, what the, the, rail, the rail operator wants to do. And it has to be opposed. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Question 11, Councillor Peter Wood, will be answered by Councillor Paul Stewart. Madam Mayor, unless there's something further Councillor Stewart intends to say in answer to the first question this evening, I'm happy to withdraw. You're withdrawing the question, Councillor Wood. Unless there's something further Councillor Stewart has to say. Thank you very much indeed. I'm sure there won't be. Councillor 12. Uh, question 12, Councillor Hodson. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Hodson, do you wish to speak, or ask your question on trip to China or have you had enough information this evening? 
Well, um, may I, I show you how? Well, the previous question was specifically about the um, the uh, the leader, the the cost of the leader's trip, and I I'm, I have no issue with that. And it was quite nice the leader to clarify how much it did cost. To just to clarify, what I'm getting at here is. Um, China is notoriously a very hard market to break into and extremely competitive. So I want to know how that, um, the money that is spent in your visit, will have an impact and, and how we can hope to have an impact for the benefit of the world. Thank you. That is, well, that is the question, I think. It's the justification of the trip. That's what, that's what I'm asking. Lita, are you wanting to give a brief response? I'm quite happy to repeat chapter and verse from the couple of questions, to be perfectly honest, because it's a good news story. It's Council Hodson, I believe it is easily value for money. I, I really do think that anybody who is sitting, looking at it fairly, seeing that the investment of £3,030 for me to go to Harbin on the 3rd of January to be there for five days at the start of the year to work with the business investment team with 24 cities and 24 city regions, including Harbin, which is the regional capital in the northeast of China, and will be a huge economic driver going forward in the 21st century, uh, to enable that, to sit down and talk with all those businesses, to find out what's going on in Aarhus and Denmark, Denmark, all the way to Taranaki in New Zealand and everything in between, right? To give our business investment team the best opportunity to engage with those people. And these pe this team has a proven record, I'll repeat it, £533.2 million in direct inward investment to this city in the last five years because we've gone overseas to find new markets and bring money in business here. If you can't see that, Councillor Hodson, you do need glasses because I think it's clear to everybody in the room. Thank you very much, my Thank you very much. Thank you very much, gentlemen. The next question is by Councillor Barry Curran and will be responded to by Councillor John Kelly. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Firstly, can I congratulate all those involved in the successful bid by Sun and City Council and its strategic partners to secure funding from the FA, the Premier League and Sports England National Park Life Football Hope Programme. <coughs> would the Leader please update Council as to the time frame for the implementation of three proposed hubs in Sunderland and the impact this will bring sport to the city. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Can I thank Councillor Curran for advance notification of his question? Madam Mayor, we've actually already started, and on Monday the 21st um, of this year, across the three sites, Fort Quarry, Community North Sports Complex Downhill, and Northern Area Playing Fields, we've had uh, opportunities for all the space to go into the ground and start the work. Detail of the exact site ordinance for all three sites will be communicated in due course, but it's anticipated that all three hubs will become operational this year, enabling football to be created across the site, uh, the site in 2019-2020 football season. Hope dates on all to all members will be provided on a monthly basis. And the aims of the Park Life programme, Madam Mayor, uh, is to ensure grassroots football is accessible, sustainable, with the impact being an increase in individuals of all ages and abilities to have been physically active. Madam Mayor, we've had some really fantastic support from the Durham FA, the, the Premier League and, and countless other organisations. And indeed, Madam Mayor, recently we organised a trip to go down to Sheffield, it was, um, for colleagues to have a look at the park life which is operational down there. Madam Mayor, I'm dis dismayed to say that one opposition councillor went down it was all Labour councillors who took the opportunity, and the opportunity was open to everybody, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Next question, Councillor Michael Dixon, and again will be answered by Councillor John Kelly. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, the narrow failure to become the 2021 City of Culture was, of course, a great disappointment. Can the portfolio holder confirm? that the subsequent work being carried out by the Council since that decision in late 2017 is such that the experience gained by all concerned involved sorry, in the bid process has been fully utilised to ensure that the rich cultural story of the city will become more widely known. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Again, thank you, Madam Mayor, and again, thanks to Councillor Dixon for the question. Um, Madam Mayor, I think the last 12 months has been a 
a whirlwind of a 12 months, to be honest. Um, the Summon Council has continued to invest in the city cultural offer. They're investing in big events such as tall ships, as well as ongoing support for uh, venues such as the Museum and Winter Garden in of Washington. The city has recently been successful uh, at raising uh, national investment for the museum through the uh, Wilson Foundation. City Council continues to work with bidding partners, the University of Sunderland and the Mac Trust, uh, for the development of Sunderland culture. With the partners, we we are seeing a number of important cultural projects um, in development, such as the new fire station. We believe uh, we will see around 600 million invested in culture in the city over the next seven years. And as we set out uh, the 24/7 strategy, Madam Mayor, I think you know we were launching this weekend the Leonardo da Vinci collection that's in Sunderland. There are so many fantastic stories. And I think that there is a drive and an ambition for this city to continue forward with strong cultural activity, not only in the city centre, but across the whole city. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you very much indeed, gentlemen. Next question is from Councillor Stephen <coughs> O'Brien, and it will be answered by Councillor Stuart Porthouse. The question reads, can the leader clarify what steps the council can take to bring derelict fire damaged properties back into use? Councillor Porthouse. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, and I thank Councillor Stephen O'Brien for the uh, for the question. Uh, but really, is this is this the kind of question you bring to council? I mean, is this this is a serious business here, and bringing lightweight questions to council really is a waste of all of our people's time. The responsibility for bringing derelict, fire damaged properties back to use lies with the building owner, and as a councillor, you should know that. Depending upon the circumstances, the council can use enforcement powers to make those responsible take action. If such buildings are unsafe or blight in the main of the surrounding community. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, gentlemen. Question 16 is from Councillor Doris Turner and will be answered by Councillor Dr Geoffrey Walker. Thank you, Madam Mayor. <coughs> The main shared project, SIB funding, which has been awarded to organisations in the Hetton Ward to help combat social isolation, is been a huge success, not only helping socially isolated people, but also helping volunteers, especially those who are, have faced loneliness themselves. One of the most recent projects is the Men's Shed, entitled Down the Pit, which has taken place at Hetton Lions Country Park. A future project which has been awarded funding is the development of the community allotment. Could the portfolio holder tell the council if there is feedback as to how the participants have been helped and how it has made a difference in their lives? Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And uh, thank you, Councillor Turner, for giving me the opportunity to share the uh, positive outcomes of this project. £3,000 SIB was successfully awarded to Springboard in March 2018 as part of the Coalfield Area Committee Social Isolation Priority. The project run from April 2018 to March 2019 when it would complete and when the, an evaluation would be completed after that date. The project target males who are at risk of social isolation were encouraged and engaged in activities and events in the local area of Hetton, predominantly Hetton Lions, Country Park and Down Pits Lane. The programme initially focused on building friendships and delivering a limited range of activities including heritage and history, researching, cooking, IT skills and horticulture. Males are targeted in a number of ways including working with partners such as Hetton Hub, Hetton New Dawn, GP surgeries and with local job <coughs> centres. The group formally meets each Friday and there are up to 15 participants at any one time. The sessions have developed and other activities and events now take place depending on the requests and interests of participants. A number of these members now visit the park on a more frequent basis, and some have learned new skills in horticulture, forestry, and arboriculture, which has led them to acting as volunteers, supporting maintenance of the park. A very great success story, I think. New friendships are being forged, and members meet and take part in activities outside the session. The park building is available as a space to socialize and build new networks. Positive outcomes already identified include people feel more connected and less isolated, people have learned new skills, the park has new volunteers, 
members are aware and aware referred to other services and activities. And I welcome the full evaluation report forthcoming. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you to everyone for their questions. And that concludes the 30-minute period. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have four notices of motion to get through. Can we put that to a vote? A show of hands on vote. <laughs> Madam Mayor, there are 13 votes in favour, one abstention, 47 votes against, and therefore the motion is defeated. Thank you very much indeed. The rest of the questions they will be answered to the uh, person who has submitted the question. So what should she have pressed? <laughs> that will be noted. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Thank you. So we now move on to our first notice of motion tonight. I invite Councillor Checker to read and move her notice of motion. Madam Mayor. Periods are unnatural and female health is important. Neither should be taboo subjects in this council chamber or anywhere else. Having a period should not be considered a luxury as it is not a choice but a decades long and expensive reality of being a woman. Everyone who needs sanitary products including tampons, towels, pads and other items should have access to them. In recognising this basic right this council notes that one in 10 girls and women aged 14 to 21 are unable to afford sanitary products. Almost 140,000 girls and young women, particularly amongst girls who are in receipt of free school meals, have missed school in the last UK year because they cannot afford to buy sanitary products. 91% of girls and young women say they've been asked to buy a pad or a tampon for a friend. This council, therefore, agrees to work with its partners to ensure that nobody in, this in Sunderland suffers through the provision of free sanitary products for all who need them in all civic buildings at the earliest opportunity. Local schools, including primary schools, given the increasing number of girls beginning their periods as early as eight, maintaining a provision of sanitary products for pupils, and local employers being encouraged to provide them on site for staff and visitors. I so move the motion down there. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Checker. Councillor Kelly, would you like to second the motion? Madam Mayor, second the motion and reserve the right to speak. Councillor Checker, would you like to speak to the motion? I would, Madam Mayor. Would you like me to do that now? Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'm des delighted to represent this motion to the Council today allowing me to break the silence regarding periods in this chamber and hopefully within our wider communities. Especially the shame experienced by those girls and women who are suffering the undignified embarrassment of period poverty. As a woman who was once a schoolgirl, I can remember the shame around periods. This humiliating stigma around menstruation is distressing enough. This is hugely amplified for girls and women who can't afford sanitary products. All women have faced the mess of an unexpected early period, myself included. But the idea that for some, this is the bloody reality of every day, of every period, is profoundly <coughs> upsetting, and for me, this is galvanising. Historically, period poverty has been a taboo subject, but it hit the public, public consciousness in December 2018 with the release of the hard-hitting film I, Daniel Blake. One scene where a struggling single mother is caught stealing sanitary towels particularly caught the imagination of the public and food banks were flooded with donations of menstrual products. But it didn't stop there. Following this, the media were full of reports of schoolgirls routinely missing school because they were unable to afford menstrual products. 
children as young as 10 were choosing to stay home to avoid the embarrassment of bleeding on their school uniform in front of their peers because they weren't adequately protected. They miss school every month because they cannot face the shame and fear of going to school using socks stuffed with tissues, old torn t-shirts or newspaper. In these families, menstrual products are an unattainable luxury. Period poverty is a worldwide phenomenon. Harrowing cases of poor menstrual hygiene are commonplace in countries like India, Kenya and Cambodia, where they have battled for years to prevent girls from dropping out of school in communities where mattress stuffing and leaves are often used for menstrual management. Yet the Kenyan government have promised to provide all school girls with, with free menstrual pads. And more recently, the Indian state of Kerala launched a scheme which will distribute free menstrual products in around 300 schools. And yet our government, in our rich nation, is still refusing to act. Instead, taxing us for sanitary products as a luxury item and refusing to acknowledge period poverty as the national outrage that it is. It is silence that's preventing real progress from being made. And within Sunderland, we're here to break that tonight. The stigma and the shame that, that shrouds menstruation means girls are left to improvise alone every month, often without any knowledge from their family members or friends. As we live in a world where periods are euphemised and belittled, blue liquid is preferred to actual blood on TV adverts for sanitary towels, it's no surprise that our young women cannot and do not ask for help. We need to dispel this nonsensical taboo, taboo through conversation. By talking about our periods freely and honestly as possible, we can teach girls as well as boys and men, that they are a completely natural process, part of the reproductive cycle and are absolutely nothing to be whispering about. Madam Mayor, until the government stands up and take notice, it's down to us in Sunderland and within this council to take action. This is a public health issue which is directly caused by child and family poverty. You will see that this motion supports the, available of sa the availability of sanitary products in civic buildings such as this very building, our libraries and our school. Madam Mayor, my research and conversations over the last few weeks have begun these discussions already, with local businesses already indicating support for employees and customers. Leading the way with this is our joint venture partner for Leisure Services, Everyone Active, who since November last year have had a basket with complementary sanitary products within all female staff areas, and following our recent discussions are looking to roll this out to Leisure Centre customers in the future. Madam Mayor, we're here within Sunderland City Council. We commissioned the 0 to 19 school nursing service. Through my research for this evening, I've heard heartbreaking stories from school nurses who are providing sanitary products for students from their own pocket due to the impact and the shame menstruation is having on their mental health, their well-being and their education. Teachers, youth workers and community volunteers are doing the same. Madam Mayor, I've been inundated with information from trade unions and charities wishing to tell me how they've been supporting this campaign already within our city, within our region and nationally. As a UNITE member, I'm, I'm proud that UNITE are leading the campaign and are encouraging local authorities like ours to pass motions like this one, as well as lobbying government regarding period dignity in the removal of the appalling luxury VAT on menstrual products. They're spreading that message by making, that by making changes in our workplaces, our places of education and in society, women and girls will be able to have a positive period knowing that they're able to access sanitary products. Locally, Asdor have been campaigning and gathering donations in supermarkets, which I'm sure people in this room will have seen them recently while undertaking their grocery shopping in Tesco's and Morrison's. Astonishingly, recently a 240 litre wheelie bin was filled with donations of menstrual products in a single day. These have already been distributed across the regions and these supermarkets themselves are now beginning to provide these products for their employees thanks to this work. Period poverty is prevalent. The latest research from children's charity Plan International UK reports that one in ten young women aged 14 to 21 have been unable to afford period products. We know that we have these families and children living in poverty in Sunderland. Years of austerity mean that food bank dependency has dramatically increased. So if there are any cynics in the room, I will say this, it's quite simple. If you can't afford food, you can't afford menstrual products. It's for this reason that within my own ward in Southwick, my colleagues and I, through funds allocated from the community chest, will shortly be distributing donations of sanitary products through our VCS network and the Salvation Army to the Food Bank, Family Centre, Community Centre, Community Cafe, Youth Project, Carers Centre, Health Centre and Schools. And I'm sure other councillors across the city are doing the same. In Scotland, vital steps are being taken to address these issues. They have a scheme offering free products to low-income families and being, becoming the first national government ever to provide free access to products to schools, colleges and universities in England, especially here in the northeast of England, we're being left behind. 
The government has said that period poverty is an issue for schools to tackle themselves, whilst horrifically slashing education budgets. I'm a school governor, and I know the difficult decisions schools have to make with an to piece of budget, although I know that some schools have started to provide these products. Again, I've met with staff who've been buying period products for their pupils with their own money, and I know that about hearing, on hearing about the local campaign run by Usdor, half a dozen or more schools have approached them to be considered for allocation of their donated products for their students, and also, shockingly, for their staff. The responsibility to ensure that everyone can participate in their education lies with the government, not individual schools or teachers. The right to an education is a fundamental human right, which should be unencumbered by biology. However, as a city council, we cannot and will not sit back and watch our young women suffer while we wait for this government to act. This <coughs> evening, I propose this motion because as a group of human beings, we should be outraged. We've waited too long for action against period poverty. Madam Mayor, if this motion is passed this evening, as I hope it will be by all parties in the Chamber, Sunderland City Council will not be the first, but will be one of very few across the country to make this commitment. For example, Stoke-on-Trent, as part of a charitable partnership, is now providing menstrual products in all of their 80 schools, and I hope that Sunderland can soon follow suit. Menstrual care is undoubtedly a human right, and it's time for our government to address the fact that some British girls are deprived of it. Despite many campaigns, the government has not responded to the atrocity of period poverty, and it's for this reason, on behalf of the girls and women in Sunderland, that I propose this motion this evening, and I hope that everyone will support it. Thank you, Madam Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Councillor Checker. Are there any amendments to the motion? Would anyone wish to speak to the motion? Councillor Oliver? Councillor Oliver? Councillor Haswell? Thank you. Councillor Oliver? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, just briefly to say that the Conservative group will be supporting the, the motion. Um, if I'm a, a little bit naughty, I'll just uh, just have a look at a, an article you may have seen, of course, in the New Statesman by uh, one of the Sunderland um, MPs, Bridget Phillipson, in which she actually specifically opposed um, these uh, sort of particular poverty programmes, such as period poverty and hunger poverty, which I know are a great, um, a great fan of, of the other. Um, Sunderland MP Sharon Hodgson, but uh, Bridget Ferguson did say, and it was an interesting article, I must say I do very strongly agree with her, that um, sort of, uh, quote, framing poverty in terms of the things that stops people buying is probably not the most effective way uh, to think about how we do tackle poverty, but having said that, if there is a particular need and there is a genuine concern and an effective campaign on this specific thing, then the Conservative group are very happy to support it. Thank you, Madam Member. Absolutely. Thank you very much indeed, Councillor Oliver. Councillor Johnston. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I am pleased that my own employer, where I'm also a United Shop steward, have agreed to support the United Period Dignity Campaign and have already implemented sanitary products for female colleagues at leisure centres across Sunderland. It's fantastic that everyone active for supporting the campaign, and I hope further employees will also support as the campaign continues to grow. I also hope we remain in Sunday City Council arms and organisations, including Sunday Care and Support, Together for Children, and Sunday City Council as an employer themselves will also endorse the campaign and implement in all their workplaces. Outside of the workplace, the campaign will also be putting pressure on the government to remove the 5% VAT that is currently on sanitary products. These are essential items to women and shouldn't be classed as a luxury item. So I will be supporting this motion tonight, Thank you very much indeed, Councillor Johnson. Councillor Haswell. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, just a couple of quick comments. First of all, the Liberal Democrat group will be supporting the motion will help you tonight. Um, another item we just want to make it a small ask was, um, I understand there's likely to be a large amount of disposal options made available, but whether a reusable options could be made available as part of the selection simply to, given that some people are the most vulnerable can't afford it, if they're in a situation at home, can't get to a civic building or to a leisure centre, etc., there is something that can be used as an interim measure to allow them to get into school or wherever else and then can deal with the situation. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Haswell. I'm sure we'll look at all options available. It is very important. 
So I take it that uh, everyone is agreed to the motion. Do you agree? agree. Do you want an electronic vote or is, every, is everyone agreed? agreed? Thank you very much indeed. Thank you all for the speaking. Uh, Councillor Kelly, I'm so sorry. Did you want to speak? Gosh, I, I have. Um, uh, it's not very often we get everyone saying they want to agree. <laughs> yeah, well, as you know, the board's done and it makes the, the job a little bit different. I just want to pick up on a couple of points. That um, The reason I second the notice of motion was that it was really about time that we broke down this barrier between female and all that. So, I mean, imagine the reaction about going around and take every toilet water and every one of the toilets in the civic centre. How much we would uh, we'd have that made with public and all the rest of it. So, it is important that we do support this notice of motion. Just want to pick up on a couple of points that, first of all, Bridget Phillipson, I believe, actually, was quite selective in the bit you've raised there, Councillor Oliver, was on about wellbeing poverty, and it was actually a bigger issue. She wasn't sort of saying that we shouldn't support people in these uh, circumstances. So, with that, Madam Mayor, and given the fact that it's already passed, I'm happy to just conclude. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Mayor. Did you wish to speak again? No? Are you happy? I'm happy, Madam Mayor. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much indeed. We move on to our second notice of motion. I might have a bit more look with this. So the second notice of motion, I call upon Councillor Johnson to read and move the notice. Thank you, Madam Mayor. The North Wales motion reads: Sunday City Council believes that the issues relating to the events at the Pickling of Orgreave on the 18th of June 1984 are both of local and national importance. In Sunderland, miners and their families were adversely affected by the events of the day in terms of wrongful arrest, false imprisonment, ill health, family breakdown, and termination of employment as a direct result of policing tactics at Orgreave. A full investigation in the military style of policing used on that day is long overdue and only a full public inquiry can fully investigate this. Sunderland City Council therefore calls on the Home Secretary to order a full public inquiry into the deployment and actions of the police on the 18th of June 1984 and to hold meaningful discussions with the All Grave Truth and Justice Campaign, the National Union of Mine Workers and Concerned MPs. And I so move the motion, motion Madam Mayor. Thank you very much indeed. Councillor Cunningham, do you wish to second the motion? I set the notice of motion, Madam Mayor, and I reserve the right to speak. Thank you. Councillor Johnson, would you like to speak to the motion? Thank you, Madam Mayor. <clears throat> this motion tonight is something close to my own heart. It not only affected me personally, but my family as well, and I'm sure many others here tonight. I was born nine days after Orgrave. My dad was a minor, and he was on strike the first year of my life. Growing up, my mum told me the stories of what happened to them in that time, so I've always had those strong labour roots and solidarity. She always said if it wasn't for the financial support my grandparents provided, my grandfather retired mine himself, she didn't know what they would have done, long before the word food banks was ever heard in our communities. In 1984, the National Union of Mine Workers, the NUM, launched a national strike in response to the plans from the National Coal Board that said they wanted to close 20 mines. The NUM maintained and events proved them right the more than 70 pits were on the hit list to be closed. In the decade that followed, the coal mining industry was effectively destroyed with the loss of thousands of jobs. The William Mouth Lodge banner that hangs in this chamber tonight, over 2,000 jobs were lost. In Eppelin Colliery, part of the Cocktail Ward now, over 1,300 jobs were lost. In response to this, on the 18th of June 1984, a mass pit was called by the anywhere outside the Orgreave Coking Plant, aimed at disrupting the supply of coke to the power station of Scunthorpe. After police had previously done their utmost to prevent would-be pickets from reaching their destinations, this time they couldn't be more helpful. Guarding and mushroom miners to the site in particular the top side of the field to the south of the plant, many of the pickets were surprised by this unusual display of police courtesy and were right to be suspicious. The field was bounded at the bottom by a corner of police officers six or more deep, blocking access to the plant. The two sides were patrolled by dog handlers with their charges. After the initial and ritual pushes against the police lines, the Assistant Chief Constable ordered the police lines to open up. What followed, Madam Mayor, was dozens of mounted police officers armed with long truncheons charging up the field, followed by snatch squad officers in riot gear with short shields and truncheons. The miners fled up the hill. 
Many of those who couldn't or wouldn't run were assaulted with the buttons, causing several serious injuries and dragged back through the police lines. Several similar charges followed, forcing the miners up into the village where they tried to find refuge in the gardens and the yards of industrial units. The police continued to run about, clubbing and arresting miners indiscriminately. What happened on that day, Madam Mayor, was not a battle, but a rout, and it was a miracle that no one was killed. A police state in action, with 6,000 officers brought in from all over the country. They were all there, senior officers, superintendents, chief superintendents, and getting stuck into and encouraging other officers. This is the word from PC Martin from Northumbrian Police himself, who was seen on television straddling a defenceless miner on the ground and battling repeatedly about the head with his truncheon. All of this violence encouraged and directed at our miners, who were there, good, hardworking, and decent human beings, striving to save their jobs, their families, and their communities from an establishment that had decided to take them on. Defenceless men being chased through the streets by mounted police officers and attacked with extended batons. Nobody was running the police in and nobody was keeping them in check. And why would they be when the Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher at that time had even called them the enemy within? What a disgraceful insult to all those men who had built our economy with their labour. I was proud to walk with those great works from the Edmund Banner Group last year ahead of the Derry Miners Gala and I'm joined here tonight by Derek and Jack Hopnich part of that group, and again I was reminded of the stories that happened in that time. We also have an ex-mayor of this city, Councillor Bob Heron, who was also in Borgreave and was attacked and bitten by a police dog. The effects these events had on their minds and their families continued long after that year. In total, 55 miners were arrested in Orgreave at the top side of the field, and all of them were charged with riot, an offence which at that time carried a potential life sentence. A further 40 miners were arrested at the bottom and charged with unlawful assembly. It took a year of waiting for a court case to be prepared. The stress this would have had on themselves and their families, I can't even imagine. In May 1985, though, 15 miners, all charged with riot, appeared at Sheffield Crown Court. The trial collapsed after 48 days of waiting, though, when the prosecution abandoned the case. It had become clear as police witnesses came in and out of the court that many officers had large parts of their statements dictated to them and many were relied on their accounts. One statement forged by a police officer's signature disappeared from the court over lunchtime, never to reappear. It also emerged in the trial that new and unlawful public order policing tactics had been used for the first time in the The trial descended into a farce and the prosecution, cutting its losses, dropped the cases against the remaining 80 minors. There was never any investigation into the conduct of the police for assaulting, wrongfully arresting and falsely prosecuting so many minors nor for lying in evidence. Not a single officer faced disciplining or criminal proceedings. So how much was the establishment involved in this? Well, the Conservative MP Nicholas Ridley wrote a report years before that, better known as the Ridley Plan, a callous plan that made it clear the decision was made years before to take on the mining industry as that was the biggest prize. Coal stocks were built up and the police force strengthened, all in preparation. This was a political action led by Margaret Thatcher and the Conservative government, all aimed with the aim of destroying the miners union and closing down our mining communities. What happened at Orgrave was not simply the most violent police behaviour seen in the modern industrial disputes, but the culmination of a concerted political campaign to diminish the strength of the trade unions without any thought or compassion for the people and the communities that were suffering standing in their way. A policy that clearly indicated there would be no comeback on the police to assist in this to happen. The media also played their part in betraying the government's version of events after Orgrave and media unfairly vilified the miners for provoking the violence when in fact it was the police who had instigated it. Our mining communities turned for the head accountability of what happened on that day, but as Orgrave represents one of the most serious miscarriages of justice in this country's history and it has never been addressed. It is important that the truth is established and the police have brought their account. Many of the miners have been left with ongoing physical and psychological problems. Many lost their jobs, their marriages and were left with a sense of grievance and untrust treatment that continues to haunt them even today. It led to a massive breakdown in trust of police in former mining communities and this continues today among the children and the grandchildren of those miners. And not only that, 
We all still to this day have to suffer due to a Conservative government that over the last nine years has decided to take on and decimate everything else we have left. Our local authority budgets, our NHS, the fire service, the time where you fire and rescue have already stated that they've suffered the £30 million rail terms cut since 2010. And some of our Conservative councils opposite have even had shamefully had the audacity to go on the Harrington, Farrington, Lakeside, Facebook page and put the blame for this at local Labour councillors. You should be standing up your own government's austerity policy, not cowering behind it on social media. Yeah, 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 yeah. And ironically, after everything I've already said tonight, Madam Mayor, our police force. 20,000 officers lost since 2010 from our communities. The mine has always said the police are on the wrong side and will come for you next. Nearly 10 years of a Conservative government propped up previously by the Lib Dems to help them, they haven't been wrong. Every generation has to suffer and fight the same battles over and over again with attacks on the working class, poor, the weak and the old, all inevitable with the Conservative government in power. But there's one thing they cannot take from us, and that's the love and compassion for family, communities and people. In 2007, my mayor, I lost my own mum, and uh, I know if she was still with us today, we can see what was happening. She would remind me of all those stories I grew up with, and still say, we'll never forget what they did to us. Never forgive, and never forget. I would like to say a special thank you tonight to the Audrey Truth and Justice campaign, who are represented by John and Beverly for their dedication and commitment for a full public inquiry and the answers that so many people deserve. I can assure them tonight the North remembers. And before I finish, Madam Mayor, I just want to end with a quote from Tony Benn that I feel is just as important a day as it was in 1984 during the minor strike. Progress can always be made with the two flames that are always burned within the human heart, and that's the flame of anger against injustice in the frame of hope, we can build a better world. Let's start by giving those brave miners and their families the long overdue justice they deserve. And maybe in the not so distant future now, we can finally participate in the politics of hope. And I urge all members to support this motion tonight. Thank you, Madam Member. Councillor Johnson. Does anyone have any amendments to this motion? Can I please take names of anyone who would wish to speak to the motion? Hudson. Thank you, Mayor Sunderland. Um, I was a bit briefly. I thought Kevin Johnson spoke very well, making quite vivid the events of that day in 1984. And certainly, to my mind, the story was reminiscent of Hillsborough, um, a campaign, of course, led by the public, which led to a very revealing and troubling public inquiry quite recently. Um, and on that basis, I think the Liberal Democrat group would certainly support um, the calls for a public inquiry. Um, and we'll be supporting the motion. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Councillor Ramtree. Um, thank you, Madam Mayor, for the opportunity to speak on this motion. I would like to thank my neighbouring ward colleagues, Councillors Johnston and Cunningham, for bringing this motion to Council. I wish also to commend the All Grave Truth and Justice justice campaign for their passion and commitment to ensuring what happened that day is not forgotten and for their continued pursuit of justice. I am the proud granddaughter of a miner. I grew up in a mining community and was a teenager during the miners' strike. During this time, I witnessed my friends, neighbours and family stand up to be counted, unite and support, defend jobs, defend working conditions and defend the very communities we lived in. This time of my life affirmed my political values and sense of social justice that I still carry to this day. And I will never, as long as I live, 
forget the contempt with which the Thatcher government treated our mining communities. What happened at Orgreave resonated throughout those communities and left a legacy of mistrust that remains to this day. It is heartbreaking that over 30 years later there is still no justice and no one held accountable for the actions which took place at Orgreave. As elected representatives we must speak truth to power and that truth is that it's utterly shameful that in over 30 years justice has not been achieved for all grief. I urge every single one of you in this chamber to recognise that all grief deserves truth and justice and vote in favour of this motion. Thank you very much, Councillor Rankley. Councillor Porthouse. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I fully support the justice for all great miners, and I think uh, Councillor Johnson has, has presented a compelling argument, and I fully support that. Madam Mayor, most people know that I worked in the mining industry for a number of years. Um, it started with the NCB and then the British Coal Corporation. And I remember the strikes of 1972 and 1974 that I was involved with. But the, the strike of 1984 to 85 was an absolute horrendous strike. I've seen some of the actions of the of everyone that took part in that strike was absolutely devastating to me as a as a young engineer, chief engineer at the one of the collieries that was um, primed to be closed. There was 20 collieries decided to be closed. At that time, there was 187,000 miners came out on strike because of the 20 20 collieries to be closed. Hardship and violence was part of it, and that was thrust upon the miners themselves. I mean, it was absolutely disgraceful the way they were treated throughout that period. Uh, we who, were, um, I was in senior management, British Association of Colony Management. I was one of the, the uh, executives on there for the North East. And we, we tried our best at what we could do, and our hands were tied at that particular time. But I remember at Huntington when I worked, every day we used to, and, and it's a secret, you can't tell anybody, we used to take a bucket full of coal down to the pit gates and we used to drop it off for the lads to keep the, the, um, the, the, the fire burning. And you know, within half an hour, that five or 10 tonne of coal used to disappear. No idea how those braziers could burn that amount of coal in such a short time. No idea what happened to that. Um, what I could never understand was, was why a, a, a government would want to close down a very healthy, productive mining industry, and then close it down eventually in 92, and then continue to import coal into this country. That's madness, it's politics, it's economics, crazy. And you know, this is what they do. I was one of those that marched in London to try to <coughs> prevent this, uh, the miners strike in the 84s when we went down there. And then you know, I never see any, I, 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 I never ever see any of our Tories marching for anything. It seems to always be out with the socialists, the Labour Party, who go out and we go around and we march to try and save things. And it appears for some reason that our Tory uh, friends, they just want to close things down. They want to blame the poor working man for all the problems in this world. And they started this with the miners in 1972 and 74 under the Heath government, if you remember. The miners' pay in those days was absolutely atrocious compared to other, other industries. Um, I fully support the, uh, the justice for the uh, all grave miners. It's absolutely essential that we have a public inquiry for the all grave incident on the 18th of June 1984, and I fully support this motion. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Porthouse. Councillor Atkinson, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'm proud to stand here tonight to support this motion. I was born in 84, and my dad was a mechanic at Weymouth. I wasn't old enough to remember the dark days of my dad on the picket line, or my parents burning shoes to keep warm. I do have the Russian doll, though, that was sent to me from the Russian miners, who sent Christmas presents to show unity and support with our men, and that's something I treasure to this day. Speaking to my dad about the strike, and knowing the sacrifices he made, shaped my formative years, my politics and my ethics. What happened at Orgreave is a national disgrace and Amber Rudd's response to an inquiry simply showed that a Tory leopard never changes its spots. An inquiry into Orgreave is needed. 
It needs to highlight the brutality used and sheer disdain of the working man. My dad was locked out of Weymouth in March 1984 when hundreds of men took to the picket line to peacefully and lawfully protest. The brutality that met those men was shattering. Military personnel dressed as police officers acted no better than brawling thugs. The violence they rained down was quite simply shocking. But the beatings weren't all the, the miners endured. Men were sacked for picketing. Others faced bankruptcy. Others lost their homes and their families, an unjust price to pay. The 84 strike was the first time we saw armoured vans and riot shields in Sunderland. The armour was brought in by the Met Police, who were shipped up to our coal fields and paid huge overtimes for the privilege of beating our residents, a pastime they relished, but not as much as the joy they took in goading the picket line with their pay slips to show them how much money they were making by doling out their beatings. Miners weren't just on the picket line to save their jobs, but attempting to save their communities and our futures. I'm proud that I'm from mining heritage. I'm proud of my dad. It's sad to see, though, that the Tory party is still targeting those that they deem to be the scourge of society, the homeless, the vulnerable, and those who can't fight back. But we can take up the fight. We can campaign for Allgrave and all the other pe people the Tories want to try and erase from history. Like everyone on this side, I'm proud to support this motion and call on the Tories in this chamber to repent for Thatcher's sins and support this motion. Well Thank you, Councillor Atkinson. Councillor Kelly. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I would like to support this notice of motion. I think, like everybody in this, this chamber tonight from the east side, certainly we all have mining members in our families. Um, my grandfather worked in mines until the rock fall. Basically, he took away his job. Um, he didn't have fantastic wages, didn't get fantastic compensation. He later died of lung cancer, which you know, may or may not have been down to the fact that he worked underground and, and breathed in dust. I think, Madam Mayor, that when a state comes to the point where it has to use its law enforcement agencies against the public, that's the day you know the state's failed. It's happened before with the, the Conservative Party. It will no doubt happen again with the Conservative Party. And I plead with them, support this notice of motion today, your Conservatives, yes, we accept and we will forgive you for that. However, <laughs> however, you represent people in a city that has a long, strong mining heritage. And you owe it to them people to support this noise and motion. Madam Mayor, we've seen the shipyards go, we've seen the coal, coal yards go and the, the pits all go. And to be honest, there is, it's almost a cleansing. Anything that has a strong union base, the Conservatives will attack. They'll cleanse it. Um, they'll move people out. They'll move us around the country. Norman Tebbit, get on your bike. Yeah, we couldn't afford the pedal for a car like they could, you know, so we had to use the bikes. But, Madam Mayor, I think that Osgrave was exceptional in its time. It was the clearest state that the people of this country, the workers of this country, just didn't matter to this con to a Conservative government. Um, if you ever go and watch the the Billy Elliot story, we take the singing and dancing out. There's a lot of good, hard, honest truth in there. It's a it's a play that I find really reminiscent of so many of the beatings and the attacks that were done by the police force. They didn't need an excuse. They didn't need a reason. It was pretty much a foregone conclusion that that was what was going to happen. I think that we now owe a debt of thanks to our mining communities. We owe a debt of thanks to the people who are continuing this campaign. And we do now need to see this Conservative government either give this genuine opportunity for an inquiry. And if it's an inquiry and you're convinced you haven't got blood on your hands, you've got nothing to worry about. Thank you, Madam Mayor.
Thank you, Councillor Kelly. Councillor Oliver. Madam Mayor, first of all, uh, congratulations to, to Councillor Johnston for his um, excellent uh, uh, delivery of, uh, of, of the motion. I must say I have great sympathy for, for many of the things you said um, about the minor strike. Um, like Councillor Atkinson, I received a, a present age 12 from a striking minor that had also come from the Soviet Union. I remember it very well. It was a football that was slightly misshapen. But uh, I do remember getting that from a striking minor. But as I say, it was many, many years ago. <laughs> I was only 12. I don't <laughs> Madam Mayor, there's absolutely, I think, no doubt and has been found in the inquiry that the IPCC did conduct after the South Yorkshire Police, in fact, preferred themselves to it, that there was uh, evidence of excessive force, uh, assault, perjury and perversion in the courses of justice uh, by some officers of the South Yorkshire Police at that, at that time. And that is something that is absolutely inexcusable then and would be inexcusable today. I think we need to be careful about making links with Hillsborough. Um, it was the same police force but that is not a concrete certainty that what happened at Hillsborough would not have happened but for Orgrave. Despite what I've said, Madam Mayor, I do have uh, two concerns uh, about, uh, about the motion. The first is whether uh, an inquiry would be possible at this, at this stage. Councillor Johnston did refer to it as a miscarriage of justice but remember that uh, no minor was actually sent to jail or um, killed and there were no casualties in it. So I think by saying a, so I think by saying a miscarriage of justice in legal terms, then that is, uh, that is not certain. And of course it was very different to what happened at Hillsborough. And it is of course a conservative government that brought Hillsborough to a close. A conservative government that brought the Hillsborough to a close. Since 1984, Madam Mayor, there have been very significant changes uh, in policing, um, in the oversight of policing, in the way in which um, complaints are dealt with, the creation of the Crown Prosecution Service in 1986, uh, the strengthening of that, the 2004 Police Complaints Authority and then later the Independent Police Complaints Commission, which of course is, I think, still working through the material related to Walgrave um, to see if it is actually relevant to the Hillsborough criminal investigations, which of course, I must say, um, are ongoing, and that does um, affect my judgment of this motion, that those criminal um, proceedings against um, uh, officers at Hillsborough have not yet concluded, therefore they are subdued to say. Um, another point I would make, of course, and to be honest, the Labour Party keeps doing this. We have had 13 years of a Labour government after Orgrave. 13 years in which you could have had an inquiry. 13 years in which you had the House of Commons packed full of MPs who were minors. David Blunkett, the Home Secretary, said no. Vera Baird was Solicitor General and an MP for the North East at the time. She is now campaigning for an inquiry, but at the time when she was in Parliament, she did not succeed in getting her own party to bring it about. Therefore, I will be voting against the motion. Thank you, Councillor Oliver. Councillor Dixon. Um, I've got to say this is probably the toughest um, debate that I've ever been in since I became a councillor quite a few years ago. Um, the reason being that I actually had quite um, close contacts with the mining communities for many years because I used to um, have the pleasure of collecting rents from retired miners for about seven years, uh, three mornings a week, uh, and during that time 
I honestly met the nicest people that I've ever met in my life. They were so kind, so friendly, um, and they were nice people. Uh, not many of them liked Arthur Scargill, man. That was 1976 to about 1982, and they were concerned about the direction the, the, the mining uh, union was going. But from a personal angle, um, meeting those people, I mean, it wasn't the most pleasant of jobs, been at the bottom of Victoria Street in Shotton Colliery at quarter to nine in the morning in November, getting soaking wet, but a little bit, a cup of tea, 10 or 12 doors up the road, uh, and uh, a nice, warm, cool fire. So I really am struggling a bit tonight because of the type of people who, who I met. Um, and I used to play a lot of sports and played against mining villages, um, people, the nicest people in the world I've ever met, apart from my colleagues to the left. <laughs> um, I do worry though about the, the motion. Um, I mean, he's, he's a report from um, a reporter. Uh, police uh, were being attacked with bricks, slivers of glass, and containers of fuel. Cars were rolled downhill towards policemen and ignited to make a flaming barricade, while wooden stakes had been placed in lines to prevent horse charging. Prevent horse charging. That was from um, The Guardian, where you probably read it, so it wasn't the Daily Mail. But then you had the other side of it from uh, a miner who got arrested immediately for no particular reason. Uh, and he was in a police station at Sheffield uh, before the confrontation and he watched as others, miners were brought in with blood pouring down their faces, medical attention withheld until it was demanded uh, from solicitors and of course there was the cavalry charge as well. And I'm just wondering, you know, speaking to Councillor Johnson, who was wrong, uh, Councillor Oliver said it was a very emotional uh, speech and you could tell what the word was meant. I just wonder what can be achieved by bringing all this up because you're going to get the police's version and then you're going to get the you know your version so to speak and is that not something that would upset members of your, of, of your family um, bringing it back into the the arena of, uh, of that sort of thing I, I think only you could answer that question for me but that's something I say with, with the best of intentions uh, what could be achieved because there are going to be negative remarks made about uh, the conduct of the miners. Um, well, that's that's a fact. I'm not saying it's right, I'm just saying it will be mentioned. Uh, I'm not here either to defend the South Yorkshire police, quite frankly. Sorry, I'm doing my best. Please. I'm saying I can't explain my way, but don't distract us. Um, I'm, I'm not here to defend the leadership of the South Yorkshire police. Uh, and whoever else was in their, their, their ranks. Their track record during that era, it could have been some good officers obviously, has not been very well judged by history. Uh, and indeed, uh, it was disgraceful, quite frankly. And, and we've, we've got issues in Rotherham uh, between 97 and 2013, uh, involving council, Labour council leaders and council officials, officials and the police over those poor young girls who weren't looked after. So the, the South Yorkshire Police um, at that time, I mean, there's a, if you ever you want to really get sad, uh, look up this case of Stephen Kishko, K-I-S-Z-K-O, and see how that poor man uh, was stitched up by the, uh, the police, um, by South Yorkshire Police in the 70s, and it was disgraceful. It was, it was one of the worst examples of miscarriage of justice in, in, in this country. And as Council Oliver said, the concept of government tax has been very good on inquiries. We've had Theresa May at Hillsborough, we had David Cameron with Northern Ireland. And the best the Labour Party could do was the Hutton inquiry about Dr Kelly's uh, suicide, possible suicide, which even the independent court called a whitewash. And then, of course, there was this Chilcot report, which was, you know, about the Iraq war, which was in 2009, published in 2016. So as a party, you've really had to be brought, dragging uh, yourselves to, to, to inquiries. And, and, and I, I would like to know, as Councillor Oliver has said, why didn't you do anything about it? 
from 1997 to 2010, when you had a majority of 300 or whatever it was. Sorry? Yeah, no. Yeah, I mean, you had the vanguard of the working class, Tony Blair as your Prime Minister, you know. And then you had Gordon Brown after that. So what, what, in 2012, I noticed on the Google, that was when you all started. What, why didn't you do something about it before? I'm just asking you. I'm asking a question. It's a, it's a fair question. It's a fair question. It's a fair question. Um, so, where am I? Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm going to think about this over the next 10 minutes or so while you're talking, I really am. Um, I'm very grateful to my, my leader, Council Oliver, for allowing me to do that. Um, and it's something which is very close to my heart, the mining community. But I do concern myself about what good it will do in relation to opening up all wounds within the mining community, within the country even. Um, that, that, that is something that I am a little bit concerned about. I have been disappointed with the politicising tonight by you towards the end, after your excellent start, and Councillor Atkinson. I, I don't have to repent over anything. No, I don't. Not as a person. My best man is Jewish. You repent over me having an anti Semitic leader. You know what I mean? Don't, don't, don't. It's patronising. Uh, and it's, it, 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 yeah, and, and, and it's, it's patronising because I really do object to that. And had you stuck to the miners and the police, I would have had the slightest trouble in supporting you tonight. But, but unfortunately, we got a bit political and that was disappointing. Um, so thank you very much for listening. It was an attempt to bring some constructive argument from this side, and maybe I achieved it. Thank you very much, Councillor Dixon. Councillor Cunningham. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor. Uh, Madam Mayor, I'd like to start off by saying it's a privilege to be second in the motion tonight. Actually, it's also a privilege to, I must say, have colleagues and, and, and follow in the footsteps of, of good colleagues like uh, Councillor Johnston. Um, I do consider myself privileged in this chamber, Madam Mayor, not only to be a councillor and represent my community, but to work alongside somebody that has such, I think, profound values and experiences. Um, I'm proud of him for what he does. Um, I'm proud of him for saying that tonight. Um, and I think our whole community will be proud of him for that wonderful speech as well, Madam Mayor. So I, I just like to put that on record too. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, other speakers such as Councillor Porthouse, Councillor Atkinson, especially Councillor Roundtree as well for talking about their personal experiences too and, and, and any kind of links that they've had to the strike as well. Uh, obviously it's, it's well documented and it, and it was great to hear from uh, also. And my thanks as well, Madam Mayor, um, would I think readily go as well to the representatives of the Orgreave Truth and Justice campaign that are here tonight. They've campaigned tirelessly, Madam Mayor, on, on an issue that I think really does matter and is of real public interest uh, and I think that it would be great tonight if uh, our council, Sunderland, could join with our North East colleague, Durham for example, and add its name to the list of councils calling for an inquiry tonight as well. I'd also like to thank representatives from other groups that are here tonight as well, notably Jack and Derek Cockridge, residents of ours from uh, the Eppleton Banner Group, also uh, people that work down in Weymouth Colliery and people from the Sunderland Trades Union Council tonight as well for showing their support uh, as well along the way, Madam Mayor. Now, Madam Mayor, many others have spoken tonight about their own personal links to the event at all grieve, and there's been little shortage of that. I thank them for sharing their important information on, on such a matter of public importance. Uh, my own link to all grieve, Madam Mayor, is also a personal one. Um, I've got close friends and relatives that were at all grieve, Madam Mayor, and experienced the events uh, at the all grieve court works. My own uncle travelled down to Orgreave with friends and colleagues, but little could have prepared him for the events that were about to unfold. He's recalled to me the unfair police treatment, the use of unnecessary force, and his memories uh, of police charging down on their position. Some recall those events, and some have even graced this chamber, Madam Mayor. Indeed, my colleague Councillor Johnston mentioned our predecessor, uh, former City Councillor Bob Heron. 
Bob was there when the police charged, and he, like many others, ran from the truncheons and shields that were charging them down. Eventually, an Alsatian caught Bob and tore his leg open. He still has the scars to this day. I wonder how many others do, Madam Mayor. Bob has memories of the local hospital where he and many others were treated in conditions that he can only compare to that of a war zone. And for all that Orgreave was an injustice in practice, injustice was also shown in Orgreave's portrayal. Studies, notably from the Glasgow Media Group, at the time have shown that the news coverage some days later from the BBC and ITN was massively skewed in favour of the position of the coal board and the government. As unarmed miners recall being charged at by sometimes mounted riot police, the news depicted a scene whereby miners were seen as charging the police line and the riot police were painted as the victims. There's of course since been the Orgreave riot trial staged in 1985 where strikers' lawyers such as Michael Mansfield had argued that BBC footage had unfairly influenced public opinion against the cause of the miners. To date, no details of any internal BBC investigation have ever been made public. Other studies from the BBC, uh, sorry, other studies of the BBC and ITN have led many to conclude that in its choice of language, of images and film editing techniques, that the evening news had sought to portray a heavily biased representation of what had occurred. However, the BBC seemed to have caught on to this fact straight away. A study by the Sheffield academic and someone I've got a lot of time for, Tony Harcup, has found that the following day the then BBC Director General said at an internal meeting that media coverage of Orgreave, quote, might not have been impartial. An inquiry, Madam Mayor, would not only provide closure for the friends and family of those brave men at Orgreave, but it would provide closure for all of the men, and yes, sometimes women, that occupied picket lines across our communities and for the wider public. Miners, their families and their communities need closure. We could perhaps begin by looking at the supposed ministerial instructions for the police to use a quote, more vigorous interpretation of their duties in their line of duty, or even as Michael Crick recorded in his diaries at the time, the NCB providing the news desks with information of the number of miners returning to work, serving to undermine the strike in what they span as the, quote, drift back to work. There is also the case to say that if other inquiries on matters of public concern have been investigated, why can't the cause of the miners at Orgreave? In his opening line for the BBC Panorama, uh, sorry, the, the BBC programme Inside Out, aired in 2012, the journalist Dan Johnson said, quote, what happened at Orgreave has been left as a footnote in history. This, of course, is exacerbated now by a government that refuses to hold an inquiry. I'm proud that a Labour government will. Yeah. Of course, the mal I'll get on to that. Of course, the maltreatment of the miners by the media and the establishment is sometimes restricted to Orgreave. It actually happened across the country, not least in my community in Appleton. In my community, people were worried about their mortgages. People were worried about their families and their communities. People pulled together in organisations such as Appleton Miners Wife Support Group, which Councillor Heron, now a Hortonwood councillor, was secretary of. And they saw the desperation that was witnessed firsthand. Most of all, it showed what our community and our people in the coal fields are made of. Passion, pride, solidarity. The Tories try to crush the enemy within, but I've got a message for Councillor Oliver, and that's that they never have and they never will. Of course, just in, in dealing with Councillor Oliver's comments, um, which of course I relish quite a lot, um, in terms of talking about the past Labour government, um, I wasn't around to experience all grief, of course, Madam Mayor, but I was around to experience the events of the last Labour government. I can assure Councillor Oliver that I owe my success in life to that government and its record, and I'm not about to shy away from that government and its record either. Investment in the health service, the minimum wage, the minimum, the minimum wage, the, the minimum wage, reducing child poverty. 
particularly to have a strike. In fact, uh, I, I found a quote recently which, which reads, quote, I was going to have as much to say as possible in the selection of that day, which of course means the selection of the day of the outbreak of the strike. But that didn't come from the National Union of Mine Workers. It didn't come from the Labour Party. It didn't come from anybody but Ian McGregor, Madam Mayor, in his autobiography. And we can't absolve the Liberal Party, Madam Mayor, for all they've supported us tonight and I uh, love our colleagues in the Liberal Party very much, for <laughs> whose leader at the time claimed that the strike was nakedly political and not industrial. It was more than political and industrial. It was about families and jobs and communities and certain members of our political class would do well to remember that. As my colleague has previously mentioned, the Tories are frankly at it again. They sold the family silver and now they're back for the rest. People in my community turn up Madam Mayor towards surgeries, worried about universal credit and the housing crisis that affects our country. We see services cut to the bone so that the Conservatives can hand tax breaks to big business. We see an explosion of zero hours contracts and other forms of insecure work, especially in my community. This is meant to be a future of opportunity, but it looks like the only opportunity that the Tories intend to create is for Boris Johnson to become Prime Minister. <laughs> Madam Mayor, I'm very pleased to say that there is a different way. We could have a Labour government that would invest in things like education, creating a national education service, and abolishing free schools and academies. A practical step towards uh, education. Would you stick to the next section? That's absolutely fine. But Madam Mayor, most importantly, what we would do is we would hold an inquiry finally into Aubrey. And on that premise, Madam Mayor, I would encourage all members of this chamber to support the motion. Well done, Councillor Cunningham. Thank you very much indeed. Councillor Johnson, you have a right to reply. Thank you, Madam Mayor. First of all, thank you to Councillor Hudson for their support in this motion motion tonight. And also from the councillors on this side of the chamber who will also spoke passionately and will be supporting the motion for their contributions. In response to the points made by Councillor Oliver regarding the inquiry, the were casualties, and there was casualties long after that day because there was an injustice that happened. Yeah. The role of the police is to maintain law and order and to protect members of the public, not to be instigated of it. The last Labour government, if I was old enough then, I would have been saying the same thing as I said tonight, and there should have been one then. Absolutely. The next Labour government had promised in their manifesto there would be an inquiry in the old grave. And if I had said myself and Councillor Cullen, we would have said the same thing if it was 15 years ago as what we said tonight. Yeah. Councillor Dixon, I sense that you have that fear within your heart, that you want to vote with the miners on this. Unfortunately, it was politically led. The police didn't have it within their power to attack the miners. There was something in the background that was making them do that and act in that way. So that it was politically led by the, by the Conservative government that time. And just like austerity, the truth hurts, I'm afraid. Um, but if we can't give some truth and closure and some justice to those brave families and those miners and what happened at that time, then I think we should support the motion and let's get that out in the open and uh, have that closure for them. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor. Councillor Johnson, thank you very much indeed. We'll now vote on the motion.
Madam Mayor, there are 56 votes in favour, one abstention and four votes Ooh. against and therefore the motion is carried. Thank you all very much indeed for the respect you gave to, every, to each other during that motion. We'll just wait a moment until the people leave the public gallery. Thank you very much. The third notice of motion tonight is the condition of the city. I call upon Councillor Oliver to read and move the motion. Um, this council recognises the frustration of residents in the city at the condition of the city centre compared to other towns and cities and resolves to bring forward ambitious plans to breathe, breathe new life into it in 2019. Thank you. Councillor Wood, um, do you second the motion? I do second the motion, Madam Mayor, and confirm that I wish to speak as well. Thank you. Councillor Oliver, would you wish to speak to the motion? Thank you very much, uh, Madam Mayor. Um, in tribute to our leader of the council, who I know uh, maintains his uh, real loyalties north of the border, I would uh, just like to tell him about a recent trip I enjoyed to Dundee. Yesterday, in fact, Madam Mayor, um, the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge opened the Victoria and Albert Museum in that city as part of a £1 billion investment, and it has already attracted more visitors than the entire population of Sunderland. Not, of course, that I'm suggesting that we send Councillor Miller back north of the border, though I understand one or two people in the city might uh, prove of that. It is, <laughs> it is, of course, a mid-sized, post-industrial, river-sized city that has moved on from jam, jute and journalism and is now one of the top places to visit. The point being that things can be done to revitalise town and city centres. Yes, they are under pressure from online shopping, from out of town retail with free parking, but Dundee, as one example of many, shows what can be done. Other city centres too, locally. Uh, Stockton has been re-energised through a heritage trail which has boosted retail and visitors and entertainment in that town. South Shields, of course, has its very, very successful The Word, which has shown that people will use libraries when they are exciting and uh, multi-use. The motion this evening, therefore, is about the detailed plans for the city centre, not so much the core strategy and the broader plans, which, of course, this group voted against. Madam Mayor, the Jimsy report, the last report into retail, concluded um, that really, in many city centres, there is actually too much retail, and that city centres need to be more varied, uh, that we need to expand housing. They are perhaps moving towards becoming more like American cities with small uh, central business districts and vibrant suburbs. It would be a problem in this city, of course, though, because you'll remember the now uh, infamous quote from John Prescott when he visited the city and he said, uh, in Sunderland they will develop their city centre when they decide where it is, because, of course, we have town, uh, town centres out in, in, in Houghton and Washington and other places. <laughs> But Madam Mayor, we do need to be moving towards a wider offer in our city centre. It's fair to say that many of the residents look at other cities like uh, Newcastle and other towns like Gateshead and Durham and feel that we could do better. We need to be looking at a wider offer in terms of housing, uh, more housing in the city centre, that we could of course convert retail units, um, a more concentration of quality shops. I know that in the West Midlands, the mayor there, Andy Street, has talked about smaller retail areas of, of better shops. Of course, there is a role for people to work, for business, for entertainment, and for food and drink. In short, to have smaller city centres, but better. Or as they put it in the Times, more fun and fewer shops. Madam Mayor, there has, of course, been some progress in Sunderland city centre over the past few years, that's fair to say, and to give credit to everyone who's been involved in that. The standout features, of course, the old fire station um, around it, the Dun Cow and the Peacock. Um, I understand the, the beer is a little bit expensive for some people in there. Um, the emerging seafront, of course, 
Um, more events, sporting and cultural, though that doesn't of course mean that I support the Spice Girls concept. Of course, in the past there has been a cultural regeneration in the 1990s and the 2000s, especially in the parks, Mowbray Park and others. Um, and the expansion of the university, of course, has greatly boosted the city. And isn't it good to see the university climbing up the international rankings of academic institutions in recent years, something that will boost the city. And especially, of course, the announcement that we will have a medical school specifically aimed at pupils from backgrounds where they haven't gone to university before, so specifically aimed at uh, people in this city. But we need, to, of course, to make something of it. The last thing we want is to train doctors and then for them to go and live elsewhere. There have, of course, been massive failures, though, that people are very acutely aware. The Vork site, now Councillor Miller, of course, blames Brexit for the Vork site. Um, I know it might seem like it, Brexit. The Vork site has been going on for 20 years. It might seem like Brexit has been going on for 20 years as well, but I can assure you it hasn't quite. Um, Sunnyside, of course, where the former MP, Chris Mullen, of course, said that the plans were far too elaborate and he uh, may, of course, be proven right, but of course, he's now more interested in his garden in Northumberland. Um, leaving, of course, a hollowed out city centre, though rounded, Nissan, Iam, Doxford, more prosperous parts in the suburb. It does, of course, need to be done through the private sector to be realistic. The Vaux site should, as a resident of the city, uh, emailed me this week, be the engine room of regeneration be a public, sorry, not, as it seems to be likely, a public sector hub. We've held out for two decades on that, are they then going to give the taxpayers the bill? It should be a bustling private sector anchor of the city. Brexit. <laughs> <laughs> We're trying our best, Councillor Miller, watch, watch this space, watch this space. Never mind trips to China, you need a trip to Brussels. Um, <laughs> It does, we do though, need to increase the private sector in Sunderland. If you look at the percentage of private sector jobs in the city centre of Leeds, it's 47%. In this city, it's only 15% of private sector jobs in the city. And by the way, this is a little dig back at Centre for Cities who weren't very helpful this week. The share of private sector jobs in the city actually went down 1998 to 2008 by 5% during the last Labour government. But, Madam Mayor, it's very easy just to turn around and say, well, um, there isn't money for, for this. I have to say I have some sympathy with the timing, but of course it was the council's choice to turn down the offers on the Vaux site and wait for so long. Um, but there has been money available. There's been £20 million pounds from the Conservative government to purchase the Vaux site, £80 million pounds from the Northern Spire, and of course a total of about £1.5 billion of overall investment into the city. Likewise, the council itself, it does have choices to make about its own capital spending. If you look at the capital budget, a very, very large amount of it, tens of millions, is earmarked to put this civic centre on the Vaux site. If you spent that on something else, you could probably easily afford a leisure centre in the city centre or the seafront, purchase a property, like a lot of councils have actually just gone out and purchased property in their city centres to boost them, or of course you could subsidise retail as well using those budgets. We do therefore, uh, Madam Mayor, to conclude, need to improve our uh -huh. leisure facilities, uh, need to be uh, in the city centre or along the, along the seafront. We need probably a landmark attraction as well, um, just as Dundee has its Victorian Albert Museum and of course Middlesbrough has a, a snow centre coming on track as well. The role of a landmark attraction to actually get people in is very, very important. We also need to be more proactive with absentee landlords. A lot of people comment on buildings of historic nature in the city centre that have trees growing out of the, of the gutters and nothing much is going on. Then you find out it's owned by some tax exile in Luxembourg or something so like that. <laughs> Which, not, not necessarily all Tories, but maybe some of them are. But anyway, I don't condone them buying property and leaving it to go to rack and ruin. Another point that can be made, and say again, another resident 
uh, after this was uh, sort of publicised in the Sunday sort of email, he said, you know, yes, you can do all these things, but look, the Labour Council brought in a public, state, a public space protection order. That's important as well, so that people feel safe in, in the city, so that they are not bothered, so that it is an enjoyable experience. We also, not just about resources, but we also have vast tracts of land along the riverside and the port that could, of course, be developed for housing and business. The port itself, to conclude, is a very good example. A lot of people now commenting on how the port is doing better. And if you look at it from the glass centre, how you can see a vibrant, bustling port with lots going on, which is the way we think the city centre should be. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much, Councillor Oliver. Councillor Wood, did you wish to speak now? Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. A town or city centre uh, and a high street are the heart of the, a community. They represent the health and prospects of that community. And of course, our city centre and these city centres up and down the country are facing immense challenges. We see tired shops, vacant units, run down, often public spaces. It's already been forecast by the Mayor for the country as a whole that during the current year, the current calendar year, 175,000 further high street jobs will go and 23,000 high street shops will close. That's the immensity of the problem that Sunderland shares with, uh, with other cities. And, and when I knock on doors uh, of voters in my ward, they're as likely to express concern about the state of the city centre as they are about anything else. Town and city centres are deeply symbolic and they matter a great deal to people. <coughs> now I always try to shop in Sunderland. It's not always possible. And the two last orders that I placed are placed online. Ooh. But, Ooh. but I did collect them at the local High Street branch of the chain involved. So new ways of shopping, Madam right Mayor, don't necessarily need to make the high street redundant. Now the core strategy to which Councillor Oliver has referred does speak of a vibrant, well-supported town and city centre where people will meet and shop. And it acknowledges the important aspect of a healthy and local economy. And it talks about that vibrant, well-supported town and indeed district centres, but by 2033, that's rather a long time ahead, Madam Mayor. We'd like to see something happening uh, before then. The city centre, as Councillor Oliver has said, has been in decline for some time, and it's not been helped, as he said, effectively by delays in developing the Vork site. And I suppose we could sit back and let that slow decline continue, but it would not be a responsible option, Madam Mayor, would it, for anyone, anyone who cares about Sunderland and the future of the city. We do need a strategy which will breathe new life into the city centre and it must be ambitious, as the motion says, and it requires leadership and investment, both in the public and the private sector. I think that we should be taking or seeking to take advantage of the future high streets fund, for example. Now, £25 million pounds won't revive the city centre, but it can help, improving the appearance, for example, of Forster Street and High Street, and perhaps regrettably we need to add Blandford Street uh, uh, as well, for obvious reasons, to that list, I don't know. And we have to accept that city centres and high streets have to change. Traditional retailers need to evolve to differentiate themselves from online, focusing perhaps on more on personal tasks or face-to-face -face experiences that they can't get from the screen. Specialist retailers, mixed-use spaces, local shops, new concepts, perhaps we're not aware of as yet, are all needed. And as Councillor Oliver said, we need to look beyond retail. Thriving city centres must offer very much more than shopping, and successful plans will make people want to come and spend time in city centres where they don't seem to want to do that now. We've got to embrace the concept of urban living. We need more people living in the city centre and along the riverside, in homes within walking distances of workplaces. We need to repurpose surplus business premises. The city centre needs to be a focus for public services. A focal point, it is a focal point for public transport, and it's a natural place for health and other services, skills training and careers advice. We want it to be green and clean. It needs to be if it's going to attract people. 
and it must be a place that people enjoy being. And yes, safe, dedicated cycle and walking routes are part of this, with lots of green space, elegant street design and furniture. An attractive city centre needs to be safe and secure with good lighting, CCTV, proactive policing, uh, the list uh, goes on. It needs to be easy to get to by public and private transport, Madam Mayor, and that includes making it easy and relatively cheap for cars to park within the city centre. We've had the debate in the past about car parking in the city, Madam Mayor. I don't propose to prolong that uh, debate tonight, but no doubt we'll return to it. Technology changes will only accelerate, and we must embrace them, including picking up options for online deliveries. I've made that point before. And yes, we need strong local leadership, and I hope that um, uh, Councillor Miller is sort of straining at the leash, wanting to provide it. Uh, Just wait. Uh, that's what he's been elected to do, and we shall judge him uh, by his success in due course, and no doubt his, his party colleagues will do the same. We need council master planning here, quite clearly, I think. We need the coordination bids, for example, with the improvement district. We're pleased to see that uh, that's going to continue, and seems to have uh, fairly strong support on the part of its members. And we need landlords working together, I think, the point that council got them made. But the best city centre with the most, <coughs> the most joined up city centre. And again, we need to retain the local character. And we also, and I can make the point, but we need a fair tax system. And that's not entirely within the, the gift of this council, I readily accept. But we can make representations, and our MPs can make representations elsewhere insofar as we need to. Traditional and online retailers should, in my view, be treated equivalently. Some form of digital services tax for online operations is needed, just as we need lower business rates. So to conclude, Madam Mayor, in my view, we need a dynamic new approach with ambitious thinking. The future is not just retail. Our town centres need housing, workplaces, public services, and leisure facilities to make them thrive. I'm happy to support and second the motion. Thank you very much indeed, Councillor Wood. Are there any amendments? Can I please take names of people who would like to speak? I've got the leader, Councillor Kelly, Councillor Porthouse, Councillor Aswell. Yes? Uh, no? No? Councillor Wood. Leader, would you like to speak? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Councillor Oliver, Councillor Woods. I'm quite happy to support your notice know, of motion, as I'm sure the Labour Group will be as well, because any local authority worth its salt has to be ambitious for its city centre and the city in its broadest sense. What does surprise me, gentlemen, is the, the tone of the notice of motion and your, your debate comments there like you've only just thought of it and that you're, you're lecturing us on what we need to be doing uh, regarding regenerating the city centre and the city in its broadest terms. This Labour Group has been quite active over several years in regenerating the city centre and the city in its broadest terms. Now, the old chestnut of the Vox site always comes up, but be honest, we didn't own it. Tesco wanted it, and if we'd put a white box the size of the Vox site on that site, we'd have destroyed Fawcett Street, <laughs> the bridges, and everything else that we had as a city centre at that time. So it could never be done because the outcome for the city would have been terrible. We'd have had not had a weak city centre, we'd have had no city centre. Now, the future of Sunderland as a city and the city centre. Reviving the fortunes of the city centre is a top priority for this council. Councillor Oliver, you're absolutely right to prioritise it as such. Like others in the key cities network, Sunderland has felt the effects of the retail sector of online shopping and the long-term decline in professional, financial and business service employment in traditional city centre locations. 
also mentioning that because our workforce in the 70s and 80s was based in the city centre supporting the shipyards and that was winnowed <coughs> out by the Thatcher government, the council did indeed replace those jobs but replaced those jobs to the west of the city centre in Nissan, in Washington, on Doxford Park, in Rainton Bridge, leaving us with a weak city centre that we have now got to grips with and are dealing with fixing. City centres need to adapt and diversify, building on assets such as universities, developing the cultural offer, encouraging the growth of creative and tech businesses and improving the quality of the built environment. We also need to encourage more people to choose to live in the heart of the city. Everything that you were talking about that you think we should be doing, we're doing. I'm just surprised you haven't read any of the documents that tell you about this. Uh, there are key themes in the, of the city centre review which have been commissioned by the chief executive and the executive director of economy in place. The first stage of that review has focused on establishing a medium to long term vision, building on what we're already doing and I will come to that. For the city centre and identifying their priorities for action. A report is being prepared by officers and will be presented to the cabinet in the spring on this and the second stage will focus on the production of a phased 10-year implementation plan and this will be completed for approval by September of this year. The goals of the emerging strategy include doubling the permanent population of the city centre, increasing employment in the city centre by 50%, especially in high-wage, high-skill occupations. Achieving these goals will drive a corresponding increase in footfall and expenditure, restoring a sense of purpose and vitality in the city centre and helping to sustain shops, food and drink outlets and a lively evening economy. Whilst those goals are undoubtedly challenging, we consider this to be the most auspicious time for change in many years. The BEAM, the first new building on the Vox site, will be completed in the spring of this year and proposals are well advanced for the new City Hall and Public Sector Hub, and I know you don't like that term, Councillor Oliver, but that's what it's termed at the moment, though it may change. All right? On an adjoining site facing St Mary's Boulevard, <laughs> and other key factors include the University of Sunderland's One Campus Master Plan, which aims to strengthen connections between the Chester Road and St Peter's site through Keel Square and the Vox site. The development, due to start in spring of this year, of the 8.2 million auditorium, which is a 700 seat performance venue, rehearsal and teaching space in the heart of our new music, arts and cultural quarter, the completion due in spring of this year of a new access and mobility plan for the city centre which will promote walking and cycling and rationalise vehicle movements, parking and public transport. All the things you're talking about we are doing. It's just like you've been in a fog and haven't seen any of it. So it does make me wonder if you lot over there actually read your documents and read the documents our officers painstakingly work to prepare for you. Now there will be more details soon but the headline features of the city centre vision and strategy will include the creation of a new central district, dist district business district, including the beam at the east end of the Vox site, with the potential to expand into High Street West, establishing a civic and learning quarter around the new city hall, including a library, which will be connected through Keel Square, the cultural quarter in the new city park, which is due for completion this year, the development of a garden community, a new residential neighbourhood with settlements uh, at Vox, Farringdon Row and Sheepfolds, ranged around Galleys Gill, investment in the enabling infrastructure, including uh, improved links between Vox and Keel Square, High Street West and the implementation of the One Campus Greenway with a new river crossing for pedestrians and cyclists. Is this not enough? Is this showing you that we're being aspirational and that this side of the chamber we're actually getting on with delivering changes to the city centre and the city in its broadest sense? The first phase of the investment plan will focus on the north side of the city centre in Vox but we are also developing proposals for other areas including Sunnyside and the Homeside Triangle as well as an action plan to improve wayfinding, maintenance of the public realm, refuse collection and street cleaning throughout the city centre. This action plan will improve the day-to-day -day experience of people visiting the city centre to work or shop and for our local residents. And I've had to cut this down and it's still three pages. Other developments include Keel Square Hotel, 
There is planning consent and a detailed design for a hotel on Keel Square. Commercial discussions are continuing with interested parties. Gilbridge House. Hayes Travel is creating a new head office, relocating staff from four separate offices across the city to this prominent site on Keel Square, and discussions are continuing about a proposal to convert the former Gilbridge Police Station into a hub for the creative and cultural industries. Our Heritage Action Zone, that status was granted in 2018 for an area which includes Fawcett Street, the east end of High Street West and High Street, e High Street East. This status enables private landlords to secure grant funding for the restoration of historic properties. Work has already started at 100 to 175 High Street West and Hutchinson's Building, which is Mackey's Corner. Bishop Wearmouth Conservation Area. The council secured 1.9 million from the Heritage Lottery Fund in 2018 to undertake a townscape heritage scheme within that conservation area. The five-year project will provide grant assistance to owners and tenants of historic buildings such as the Empire Theatre, enabling improvements to town, park and support activities and events in that area. The City Hall Public Sector Hub. The planning application has been submitted and the business case will be discussed by Cabinet in spring of this year. The City Hall will symbolise the regeneration of the city centre and in combination with the BEAM help to attract private sector investment in the new central business district. I hope you're smiling, Councillor Oliver. Private sector, there you go. Right. The public sector hub will bring together the delivery of a range of public services on one site, improving the customer journey by making a range of services easier to navigate. Together for Children, the Youth Offending Team, Next Steps and Department of Work and Pensions are all planning to move onto this site. A proper hub for people to come and get many things done in one easy journey. Central Station, and I'm so glad you mentioned Dundee. Because they do have a beautiful new museum, you're absolutely correct, but they've got a nicer railway station. And we've been speaking to them about how they got the railway station done. A detailed design is currently being prepared for a new concourse building to replace the current building at the south end of the station. The Council and Nexus have committed capital funding for this project, which will include improved passenger facilities, an application to the Transforming Cities Fund has been made for additional funds. If the bid is successful, work will start in 2020 to 2021. Officers have also been exploring the feasibility of creating a new northern entrance to the station to serve High Street West and the Vox site. Jackie White's Market. Re work refurbishment work is due to commence in spring 2019 after full consultation with the staff, the stallholders on that site. And the future High Streets Fund. You'll be glad to hear, Robert, that we have actually submitted a detailed business case to access that money. So the council is doing what it can to get its share of those funds to enable us to commence and do even more work, even more work than what I've already said, to continue to bring our 21st century city centre offer to the residents of the city. Leader. Um, <coughs> time. Do you have an extension, Madam Mayor? I'll second that. Thank you. I'm nearly finished, Madam Mayor. Is that agreed? Thank you. In closing, I gently suggest the following reading material, which will enlighten you further, Councillor Oliver. Homework for the next council meeting. The Sunderland Transforming Our City, the 369 Vision. It's a document that we brought in 2015-2016. There are 44 key projects listed in there. It's one of the best documents, in my opinion, that this council, this <coughs> Labour group, has ever managed through our officers to deliver. Now, 44 key projects listed since 2015, and several of them, about a third of them, have now been completed, and about another third are nearing completion. So you can see that we've been working on building out the new city centre bringing our city forward for quite some time, and it goes well beyond before 2015 as well. The Sunderland City Plan 2016 to 2020 carries a surprising amount of this detail. I suggest you all read it. The Sunderland Big Business Plan 2014 to 2019, the bid were hugely, hugely important in working with us and getting a lot of this done. And now that they've got their license for the next five years, I'm looking forward to their next business plan to enable us to carry forward with that. Sunderland's Housing Investment Prospectus, 
It's a council document. Very, it's got a great deal of detail about what we're trying to do with housing, where we're trying to do it, how we're trying to do it, who we're working with to get the money. Siglian's development and investment plans up to 2019. Very detailed, once again showing fully what we're trying to do, where we're trying to do it. The core strategy and development plan, 2015 to 2033 draft, because it's currently with the planning inspector, and we've got to go through this year with the public quite rightly making further uh, conversations with the planning inspector about the things that, that they are unhappy with and the planning inspector will make their decision on that at that stage. But we're not saying we're going to do everything by 2033, uh, Councillor Oliver. It is an 18 year plan. Not everything's going to get built on the first day or the last day. It's to show the aspiration that, that this Labour group has for this city going forward an understanding that we will have a short term plan, a medium term plan and lo and behold a long term plan because that is how ministers and government like to know that we are grown ups and we are serious about how we get access to money and what we do with it. And of course, in closing, I support the most motion. I do appreciate you bringing it as something for us to discuss, but I would say going forward, the next time, come up with an original idea of your own, because I'm sick to death of this Labour group coming up with them first. And don't ride on our coattails, Councillor Oliver. But I do appreciate the thought behind your notice of motion. I hope everybody supports it. Thank you. Thank you, Leader. Councillor Kelly. Thank you, Madam Mayor. It's very, very short. Um, because um, the leader talks for a considerable period of time, which is always useful. Just a couple of quick points. Um, there's a difference between Dundee and Sunderland. Dundee are directly run by the Conservative government, as we are here in England. They are under the SNP. It's so much better, to be perfectly honest. Um, lots of shipbuilding and pirates plant had a significant impact on the number of jobs in the city. Guess what? That was a Margaret Thatcher thing, where she traded the shipbuilding uh, with Europe in order to bring other things into the city. So, you know, again, another one of those things. But I wanted to remind people that we used to have a fantastic town hall, absolutely stunning architecture, and I appreciate it, it's hard to imagine, but once upon a time, the Conservatives ran Sunderland, <laughs> and it's a really strange, it's a, it's a really strange feeling, Madam Mayor, but, this fantastic building that is now much lamented and missed by the people of the city was pulled down by a Conservative government, or a Conservative council, I should say. So, you know, while I will support this, I think every single elected member has aspirations, not only for the city centre, but for the whole of the city of Sunderland. So I will support this motion, but again, just think that the the right amount of blame should be put in the right places for some of the derogation and derogation we've got. Thank you very much, Councillor Kelly. Councillor Porthouse. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, Madam Mayor, I'm scratching my head what to say here. Um, the leader filled it all in. He hasn't, he hasn't actually left us very much to say. Um, oh no, I'm going to have me five minutes worth here. Can, can I ask Councillor Oliver and Councillor, where do you live? What mushroom is it that you live under? Is there a cloud over the top of your head? Do you not read any of the documents that are published? The ladies actually itemised them all, and I mean they're there. But you're hypocritical because at the last meeting you voted against the draft core strategy development plan, yeah. Yeah, yeah. which is the future building of the city, and you voted against it. And yet you have the audacity to come along this evening and put a a, a, a motion in the condition of the city centre. Yes, we know the city centre is not right. We know the plans are there to go ahead with it. But why don't you two know? Where have you been? Can I just say, for example, you know, your government was responsible for the closure of the industry in the city. For my, not only mining, not only shipbuilding, David Brown gate boxes, Pyrex. They used to have 3,000 people work down. Um, at Hendon, they used to have seven factories here producing clothes for M&S. You had a whole host of things that your government closed down. Those people that worked there lived in Sunderland. Now then, I think what this, what this Labour Controlled Council has done in the past, it has done, it's done very well to bring jobs in, into Sunderland. 
Unfortunately, those jobs are regional jobs. So the people that work at Nissan, and let's be fair, Nissan was the size of two deep collieries, Western Weymouth, for example. That's the size of it. And look at the number of collieries that you closed down. You look at Doxford International, where the, the, the people from there come from all over the Northeast, and maybe. So those people, although we have a high workforce in Sunderland, do not live in Sunderland. And the plans are to bring them back into Sunderland and to increase the housing opportunities in Sunderland and to also increase better four and five bedroom homes. <coughs> Getting back to the, to the walk site, I, I love because you always bring the walk site. You're very good at it. 11 years, Tesco, in the Tesco land bank, 11 years. Two to three years to realign St. Mary's Boulevard. What happened the next nine years? We had austerity. £290 million pound took out of our budget just in Sunderland. Five billion in the northeast area. Five billion. And you're sitting there complaining when are you going to start building the shops and when are you going to start doing the retail? Sunderland City Council wasn't responsible for the closure of the bin stores, CNA, Blackwood. Do you remember the boots fashion? Georgia I remember the Martin, is there? <laughs> in Jutlands. I mean, a council doesn't close shops down. Neither can it has the reserve, has it got the possibility to open shop. They can help and encourage it to work. The ladies mentioned all the other ones, the Bishop Weymouth, Townscale, Haas, Vaughan, now progressing, Northern, uh, Northern Spy, I am. Um, so, I mean, it's there. Um, I suggest that you have a look at the, the Grimsby Review. Um, I was down at the meeting of the K Cities yesterday, and he was there, and he's a very clever man. And he put, up, he put up on the screen of all the large companies that have closed down, you know, our uh, Toys for Us and all those. He put another one up, and in there he's keep telling everybody, he's, he's told the investors and that, these will go in the next four to five years. I'm not going to tell you what they are because it, was, it might alarm one or two people, but he, he's, 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 he knows so much about um, retailing in city centres. Madam Mayor, I'm going to support the, uh, the motion from our old colleagues over there. I don't think they know what they're doing. I don't think they know where they live. I don't think that they read anything that goes in front of them. And it's absolutely disgraceful that they should, they should know that. They bring these, these motions to council, that this council is proactive, it's busy, it's got a plan, and I support, I support this motion. But just start reading a little bit of something that's produced. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Courthouse. Councillor Wood. This was the wrong time to take up the challenge. I do Thank you, thank you. Uh, we will be. For charity, I can either stop it. Or go forward. Uh, we will be supporting this motion. Um, we live under the banner to not despair. We are being watched over. And yet, for many residents, and as a city uh, councillor, Madam Mayor, it's the hope they can't stand. Five to ten years and beyond. They've been waiting a long time. It's good to know where I can find the things that are happening in 2019. What's really useful to know is that Jackie White's market is being refurbished. Can I ask one thing? Please fix the lift. We've been asking for a long time. If that could be included, that would be splendid. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Councillor Wood. Councillor Oliver, you're right to reply. Thank you very much, um, Madam Mayor, and thank you to everyone for their, for their contributions. Um, when I listen to Councillor Miller, I'm reminded of a quote from Friedrich Engels that I gave my pupils this morning, <laughs> which was, an ounce of action is worth a ton of ideas. It was interesting, away from actually what we talk about the city centre, was the reaction of Councillor Miller and Councillor Portas. This is a public meeting, the public have been asked for their views on the city centre, and they will be told what the response was. Very kindly, a Conservative councillor passed me a piece of paper with a four-letter word to describe Councillor Miller. It begins with S, it ends with G, it's not slug, 
but it is smug. My goodness. <laughs> given, given the public perception, given the public perception of Sunderland City Centre, and I have to say you'd struggle if you walked around Sunderland all day long to find that many people who thought the city centre was where it should be, to come out with, hold on to my coattails, we have a plan. The Labour Party seem to forget two things. First of all, they've been in charge in this city for 45 years. It's, if you do any good, then that's fine. But it's no good blaming the Tories for taking down the town hall 46 years ago. We have, of course, had a local plan. I think I might just actually mention something about the local plan. The Conservatives voted against the local plan. The Democrats voted against the local plan. Three Labour councillors from Castle Ward voted against the local plan. So there you are, you have to get the chief whip up and running, I think, Councillor Miller. But um, some Labour councillors didn't vote against the, the local plan. And what happens then? Those residents in those wards where those councillors have been going around saying, Yes, yes, resident, we will support you on your concerns about the green belt and housing. Yes, yes, of course. They then email us, probably Councillor Hodson as well, and say, why did my local councillor just vote for the local plan then? So that's a very interesting one. The second thing they don't really accept is austerity has obviously affected everyone, but why is it that Newcastle, for example, and Gateshead, that get exactly the same local government funding formula have advanced and we haven't? Why is that? Yeah, of course, Councillor Hodson is absolutely right, it's a Lib Dem Councillor Hodson. It's a Lib Dem Why is that? You cannot simply blame austerity as if austerity somehow affects you differently to another city that's also a North East city, also about the same size, also an overlook. You cannot, you cannot use that as an excuse. Yeah, but the people of Sunderland say, why is Newcastle like that? And it's the same in all the things I've said. And why is Sunderland different? They want their city to be as good as that city, which gets the same formula of money. So, to sum up, Madam Mayor, yes, we will uh, do our homework, Councillor Miller, and read all these plans for the second time, of course. Um, and I do hope uh, that in the uh, future, future months, uh, it is not like Theresa May, nothing has changed, but that you show us that you are not uh, smug, but you are a man of, of action. Thank you. Thank you, Roy. Thank you very much indeed. So I think we've all agreed that we are going to uh, accept, agree this motion. Can we have a show of hands? or Do we agree the motion? Thank you very much indeed. We now move on to the last motion of the evening, which is Councillor Hodgson. Uh, would you like to read out... Oh, sorry, I do beg your pardon. The, the, the fourth notice of motion has been withdrawn for this evening. We're moving on to the fifth, fifth mentioned. I do apologise. I thought you were aware of that. Uh, uh, Councillor Hudson, could you read your notice of motion? Yes. Um, Mayor, and I move the following motion, which is entitled The Council Buffet, or How I Learned to Stop Troughing and Love the Packed Lunch. This council recognises that citizens of Sunderland feel the provision of meals to councillors <laughs> after meetings is not a justifiable use of taxpayers' money. Accordingly, the council resolves to end the provision of meals after meetings for councillors and their guests and scrap the facility for councillors to make subsistence expenses claims in cases other than an overnight stay. I move the motion, Mayor Sunderland. Councillor O'Brien, do you second the motion? I second the motion, Madam Mayor, and reserve the right to speak. Would you like to speak to the motion, Councillor Hudson? Yes, thank you, Mayor Sunderland. Um, okay. Mayor, the. Uh, <laughs> Mayor Sunderland, the provision of meals to councillors at taxpayers' expense is an anachronism. 
It's something that has been long abolished at many other local authorities, but which for some reason clings on here in Sunderland. This motion calls for us to ditch the free meals. And I will say from the off that I recognise this is a small sum amongst the council's multi-million pound outgoings, but it's not about the money, or at least it's not chiefly about the money. It's about the fact that this council, under real government pressure to make savings, draws the line at having councillors share the burden. I do not support, personally, every cut that has been passed on to this council, but I think it's appalling that the council leadership will make cuts to services to residents and yet protect itself and its own perks. I think we have to show that the punishing cuts that affect this council affect its councillors as well. And perks like free dinners should absolutely have been the first thing to go because they are indefensible. The leader, commenting to the press on the subject, said the Lib Dems are obsessed with this issue. Well, yes, Graham, we are. Uh, unless you, Graham, have been living underneath a mushroom, you would know that this council, and particularly its councillors' reputation amongst city residents, is muck. There is a long-running perception of councillors being on the gravy train, and successful, successive council leaders have done nothing to challenge it. Quite the opposite. Like the, the current leader, they've defended it with preposterous non-arguments to say it's cheaper having councillors get a free buffet than having them claim for food expenses, which to me brazenly admits to the public that you can't trust your own councillors not to waste public money. And with one former councillor writing into the echo in defence of his free dinners, that he had to excuse himself from a council this council chamber because he was, and I quote, faint with hunger. Well, I say, get a grip. This is bloody embarrassing. You cannot cut small expenses, like, for example, funding for blind charities or travel for disabled children and continue to have to pay for your dinner. Point of order, Madam Mayor. I really think we can deal without the bad language in this council chamber. I've already had an example of um, Councillor Stephen O'Brien's bad language earlier in the week, but to verbally convey that type of language in the council chamber is, in my opinion, unacceptable. And I would ask, I would ask the councillors just not to indulge in it. Yes, I agree with Councillor Lawson. I'm sure Councillor Hudson will refrain from the bad language. Hold that turn. But you can't cut small expenses like, say, funding for blind charities or travel for disabled children and continue to have the public pay for your dinner. When the council, at substantial expense, ran a full budget consultation with the public last year, the cost of councillors and their gravy trains to the taxpayer came up again and again. That's what the public told us. I raised it with you in this chamber at that meeting. But, once again, the public were not listened to, this matter was ignored, and no changes were made. The buffet and the expenses, in case you don't realise it, that's part of the gravy train. In recent years, we've still seen individual councillors claiming over £5,000 per year each on subsistence expenses. And notoriously, Mayor of Sunderland, even more on their travel expenses. There are some quite astonishing cases if you look in the, the echo. The public are not blind to this. It looks appalling and it has to stop. The Liberal Democrats on this council don't attend the buffet and do not claim subsistence expenses. We pay our own way and we go for dinner after meetings like this one and I extend an open invitation for you to join us and give your money to a local hostelry rather than take your dinner from the public purse. But we are putting forward this motion, Mayor, because we want to be able to go back to our residents and say that the council has agreed to share the burden. The cuts are being made to councillors too, because that's fair. When I explain this council's free food arrangements to councillors on other authorities, they are shocked. They think this has all gone years ago. And I know from speaking to some councillors in this chamber that you agree that these meals and buffets are unnecessary. Indeed, since the Liberal Democrats uh, have been obsessing over the issue, indeed since there have been Liberal Democrats on the council in recent years, amazingly, quietly, Labour Party expenses claims have started to tumble. The year I was elected, the claims, the uh, subsistence expenses claimed. In the year I was elected, there was published the subsistence expenses. Michael Bordy, £1,492 on food. Harry Truman, £924. Tommy Wright, £1,000. <laughs> 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 
can see that I've never claimed a single penny in subsistence or travel expenses from this council. What Councillor Hobson refers to, and it was sent to the airport, was travel out in my name when I went on a conference with three and four telecommunication that was misapplied to my name in that column on that year. I have never claimed subsistence, <laughs> never claimed <laughs> travel, <laughs> to hear for is Thank you, thank you, Councillor Mordy, for the clarification. Happy to stay corrected. But my point is what that gradually, over the, uh, over the last few years, the expenses claims that have been made by councillors have been falling quietly without comment. What I would like them to do is go the whole hog and ditch the trough. I hope that councillors will support the motion and end the provision of free meals and subsistence allowances, uh, except in the event of an oversight mistake. Thank you. Councillor Hudson. Oh, oh, Hudson, thank you very much indeed. Councillor Oliver, I understand that you wish to move an amendment. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. The amendment is as follows. Insert sum after recognises that. Insert of the full council after meetings. Insert free after provision of. Insert of the full council after meetings after guests insert or introduce a facility for councillors to pay so that the motion now reads this council recognises that some residents of Sunderland feel the provision of free meals to councillors after meetings of the full council is not a justifiable use of taxpayers money accordingly council resolves to end the provision of free meals after meetings of the full council for councillors and their guests or introduce a facility for councillors to pay and scrap the facility for councillors to make subsistence claims in cases other than an overnight stay. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Councillor Mullen, I understand you're going to second that? I will second that, Madam Mayor. Do you wish to speak to that, Councillor Oliver, to the amendment? Madam Mayor, I think it's, it's quite um, self-explanatory. The, the main change, uh, of course, is that um, I accept um, Councillor Hodson's uh, view that the public will look at this and see £5,000 um, and decide that that's not a justifiable um, expense. So councillors can, if they wish to partake in the meals, simply uh, pay for it themselves. The meals in themselves, I think, have some, some benefit of, of socialising with people from other groups and I, I, I'm quite happy to do that. Uh, but I think um, the point having been put to council, I would agree that either they are scrapped or that councillors are invited to simply pay for them themselves. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Councillor Mullen, you didn't reserve the right to speak. Do you wish to speak now? Can I ask, please, does anyone else wish to speak to the amendment? Point of order, Madam Mayor. Madam Mayor, is the motion in order? Because a motion asks the council to resolve to do something, either one thing or the other thing. This amendment is asking you to either or, to pick. So how can, um, it's effectively, is it in order that it's given a choice? Uh, yes, we are going to proceed with the amendment. It's, uh, it's asking either or, so we are going to proceed with it. Does anyone wish to speak to the amendment on this motion? Okay, so we're going to have an electronic vote. Do you agree with the amendment? We'll have a vote. Madam Mayor, there are 13 votes in favour, no abstentions, 48 votes against, and so the amendment is defeated. Thank you. Does anyone wish to speak on the substantive motive, uh, motion? Uh, 
got it, yes. Uh, leader, would you like to speak, please? Thank you, Madam Mayor. I do question whether our uh, FibDeb colleagues really understand the pressures that this council faces after nine years of austerity. I really do question the, the lucidity of your argument, ladies and gentlemen. Continually obsessing over a minor catering item at a handful of meetings clearly shows that I genuinely believe you have your priorities completely wrong. Since 2010, this council has lost over £290 million from its budget due to George Osborne's pernicious use of austerity as a political tool to attack Northern Councils, an act that was fully supported by the Lib Dems in coalition with the Tory party at the time. Now, you want to focus on £5,000, I want to focus on the effect of losing £290 million, which is the real problem with service reduction in this city. But you're trying to do cheap politics through that tiny figure because it plays to a handful of people in the city who think that councillors have their noses in the trough. Yeah. Right. Well, that you're entitled to your view, but at the end of the day, you're wrong. Uh, I have to say that uh, this is what I think of your notice of motion. Outrage. I'm outraged by it. Outrage. Right? You would think that they would want to focus on what those destructive cuts were doing to public service delivery in the city and how it was affecting residents' lives, but no, no. Can you stop stealing? That'd be nice, They continued focus on a very small amount of money that is spent to ensure that, let's get the right people first, council staff, guests and councillors can receive a basic meal. It's a basic meal. Not getting anything special going through there at the end of this meeting whenever we finish. Right? Is your pathetic attempt at a smoke screen to deflect focus from your party's appalling record in government and that you are equally complicit in inflicting great harm on this city by supporting a Tory party in the government in 2010 that was so right of centre that even Margaret Thatcher would have blushed in shame. And you were complicit in enabling austerity to come forward as a political tool, driving nearly £300 million out of the budget that delivered services to this city. And you want to quib quibble on about £5,000 out of that one. I know which figure is more important to me. A bit more outrage from me. A bit more outrage. This false flag notice of motion non-story is there to deflect criticism that can be quite rightly aimed at you. You have an abysmal record both locally and nationally and helped introduce some of the most malicious policies ever to impact on the British people. Austerity is a political tool, the bedroom tax, imposing universal credit, lying to students about fees and then supporting the Tories in government to increase them. You cannot trust the Fib Dems, the Fib Dems, the Fib Dems, they are so twisted, they cannot lie straight in bed. <laughs> More outrage. I love, I love this councillor of Brian Reef, I'm going to use it many, many times, I think. <laughs> Regarding the five... <laughs> Thank you very much. Regarding the £5,000 that we spend per year supporting our staff, our guests and councillors at our handful of full council meetings, we surely have a duty of care in that provision of a warm meal <laughs> at the end of a very long day. Full council starts at 6pm and if you're in employment, have caring duties or something else that keeps you busy until 5pm, you're going to be coming straight to council without the benefit of an evening meal and without the benefit of actually packing your packed lunch. Because I've got mine and I, I'm fine. But not everybody has the joy of having the time to do that, Councillor O'Brien, right? This can mean people going without food for more than eight hours. Our last full council on the 19th of November lasted nearly four and a half hours, finishing just before 10.30pm, 
And are people really seriously saying it is wrong to feed our staff, our guests, and all our councillors if they want it, after possibly a 10 hour break from their last meal? Are you really saying that? That in the 21st century that's how uncaring we need to be? Well, hold it gentlemen, because it's fine, it's just a ridiculous suggestion from ridiculous people completely divorced from reality in my humble opinion. I see that Councillor O'Brien's latest leaflet of lies, lies, goes on about all you, goes on about, oh, goes on about, well if you give me, if you give me a minute, if you give me a minute, I'll justify lies, right, goes on about all you can eat buffets after council meetings. All you can eat buffets, it just looks something you get on a cruise ship, isn't it? But without the cruise ship, without the lobster, without the beer, without the champagne, we're definitely doing something wrong, colleagues. What's through there is a basic mince and dumplings and a vegetable option, you know? Really, seriously, it's just a nonsense. Uh, anyway, all you can eat buffet after council meetings. No mention of how few meetings there actually are or that, and what the cost actually is, because they don't mention the fact that it's only £5,000 in this piece of rubbish, right? He goes on to overstate the cost of the proposed new civic centre by about £40 million. You need, at the end of the day, you do have difficulty as a group sorting out your finances, you really have to get a grip of what the numbers really mean. And to be saying uh, £80 million pounds for the cost of the new civic centre, which is pretty much double what it's going to cost, you, you also need to do your homework and read your literature, right? Because at the end of the day, both opposition parties now getting homework. Please, please read the documents so that you understand what the finances are about. Right? Now, Once again, Councillor O'Brien deliberately confuses revenue budgets that pay for vital services that his, yes you are, that your party and government helped cut by £290 million. So the cuts to vital services that you bang on about in this leaflet were caused by your, gov your government in 2010 to 2015. Because that's what established austerity. And then you put the cheeky bang on in here about the Labour uh, council not being able to deliver services because your party took 290 million out of our budget. That's the real story behind this leaflet. Not 5,000 pounds on a bit of food for people who've had a long day who need a meal at the end of the day. And in any other sector that I've ever worked in, as a private employer, I offend my staff if they were at this time of night because it's just what you do. Now, that is the real story behind rubbish like this notice of motion. It's a smoke street to hide the fact that the real blame lies with them and the Conservative Party. And you confuse revenue funds with capital funds because you don't understand money, clearly. We are, they don't read it, they're just not interested in anything the council produces. Just tell bare-faced lies. Now, I have to say, this, this did make me laugh. In closing, Councillor O'Brien modestly describes himself modestly, 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 modestly. Uh, as the best councillor <laughs> has ever had. <laughs> now, colleagues, don't be mean. Bless. Bless. Is that Ryan? Are you okay, Madam Mayor? Yeah. I believe that's just a good Have you seen this councillor leaflet out regarding Councillor O'Brien? And <laughs> As he might have been seen skulking around Millfield desperately looking for a new ward of residence. <laughs> Councillor Grindon has ever seen, really? Do me a favour, more like the worst councillor Grindon has never seen. <laughs> outrage! Outrage! I fully oppose the notice of motion and hope everybody joins in with me. Thank you, Madam Mayor.
Peter? Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Madam Mayor, the only place that this issue is being discussed is in this chamber. I've campaigned in Hendon, Sandale, Pallion, Fulwell, St Peter's, St Chad's, Doxford, Millfield, Barnes in the last four to five months. Not one resident has brought up on the doors to me what's in this notice of motion. Exactly. Madam Mayor, the only people who care about it are the Liberal Democratic group in the well. And they care about it because they want to distract attention away from their abysmal records, both here in Sunderland and nationally. Madam Mayor, I would commend to Council a report that's recently been published by the Centre for Cities Think Tank which stated that Sunderland has been the 17th most affected city in terms of austerity. Mm -hmm. And we all know where the austerity programme started. It started in 2010 when Nick Clegg couldn't wait to get his hands, his little greasy little hands, on a red ministerial box. He sold, he sold, he sold, he sold the party, and in particular sold the students down the river. Uh, so we, 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 we're lumbered with uh, austerity and it's been enforced and driven home even more since 2015. Madam Mayor, we should be debating in this chamber a whole raft of issues that affect the people of Sunderland. Why are the Liberal Democrats not bringing forward a motion to apologise to the people of Sunderland, indeed in the people of the country, for the impacts of the bedroom tax? There's people in my ward living with the effects of the bedroom tax that they imposed on them. Why do we not have a debate brought forward by the Liberal Democrats condemning universal credit, which is driving people to suicide in places in this country? Madam Mayor, why do we have, not have a notice of motion from the Liberal Democrats apologising? They so-called say they represent the ethnic minority people in the city, but they weren't too keen when they had to involve in, in to create the hostile environment, Madam Mayor. Madam Mayor, you go on and on and on. Cuts to local government, the crisis in local government finance started by the Liberal Democrats, the cuts to the police force up and down the country. Northumbria Police is the force in the country that has had the highest level of cuts than any police force, a policy instigated by the Liberal Democrats. Madam Mayor, we have mental health services in crisis. We have children's services in crisis, adult services in crisis. Legal aid has been stripped back because of policies of the Liberal Democrats. Why are they not bringing forward notices of motion to be at their issues? That's what the residents of the city compare about. They don't give a toss, frankly, about meals are or, or subsistence, Madam Mayor, it's an absolute disgrace. I would rather discuss the fact that the IPPR North Think Tank brought out in a report, Madam Mayor, in December 2019, that said the North of England have seen, 2018, sorry, have seen the North of England have seen a £6.3 billion worth of cuts, while the South councils have seen a £3.2 billion increase. Why are they not bringing that forward to the Thank you, Deputy. Madam Deputy. Mayor, will you please... Stick to the buffet. Yeah. It is. Madam Mayor, you know, I instructed the buffet for about a year and a half, Madam Mayor. I, I, I get three more. I've got a fiance and a dog to look after. I'm on a good night, 10 o'clock. Sorry, I think it's sausage and chips, Madam Mayor. This notice of motion is a complete and utter waste of everyone's time. When they were in government, they brought in uh, support of the Northern Powerhouse. Why are we not talking about tonight the fact that £326 per head of population is spent in residence in London? Point, point of order, the, the North East. I, 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 I would cannot accept any of these things if I want to move them, but. He really does have to stick to the motion. Yes, please. Yeah. Move the motion, Mike. Then we'll need to talk about these things. I'll stick to the motion. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Mayor, we have to ask ourselves a question. Why are the Liberal Democrats, at every single opportunity they get, bringing up the issue of subsistence expenses? Why do they want to remove the independent remuneration panel role to determine the subsistence and expenses? Why are they so hell bent on getting their hands? The political hands on a system that should be independent and rightly so it should be made independent. 
Well, it might be a clue, Madam Mayor, the fact that when the Liberal Democrats and group with the group two, they had no uh, compunction, effectively running down here day one after Councillor O'Brien was elected and Councillor Hudson was to, to claim me £6,276.96 as the leader of a minority party in opposition of Councillor O'Brien, leading the group of two who had no problems in claiming £4,184.04. <laughs> something that we can discuss in this council chamber and I think it's something that you will have to take up with the solicitor. It's not something that we wish to be discussed here and I'm sure you don't want to discuss it here. Yeah. And it was stopped. Speeches showing their courage. That we say as well. But I'm really shocked, surprised at this uh, notice of motion that's been put forward by, by the Liberal Democrats. After admit the, the the previous two council meetings, they've had, they have managed to have relatively sensible, uh, thought-provoking uh, resolutions, necessarily mm -hmm. motions that uh, <coughs> received the support. 
uh, this council chamber. But it would appear that uh, tonight they've gone back to type uh, and really looking for a, for a cheap headline. And as the leader said, try to, to hide the, the real facts of their position as a party in relation to orchestrating the austerity programme that uh, we are under. Um, I've been around quite a long time on the council and uh, in my younger days uh, I did have a full-time job and I'm just looking at uh, the sort of timetable I would have on a Wednesday before council. I mean I would need to leave work, uh, for leave work uh, about seven o'clock in the morning. Um, I would be having my lunch at about half past twelve or half an hour, uh, finishing work around about five to get to the council chamber for six, hopefully looking forward for something to eat, something warm to eat, uh, about nine or ten o'clock at night. And for people who are working full time, it is important to have that hot meal um, after a full council meeting. And we're really just talking about full council meetings here, Madam Mayor. Madam Mayor. I really find it quite surprised that, you know, considering all the discussions we've had tonight and the reference to, to the position of the council and, and the funding gap that we have of, uh, it's actually 293.9 million pounds, just to be precise, I don't know, in relation to that. I, 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 this, is, this, this is their big idea to help to solve things in the city, a lunchbox. <laughs> I, 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 I really find that. I really find that. So these are small lunchbox, and I do notice that the, the leader's got a bigger lunchbox. But <laughs> 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 I am outraged by the fact that I am outraged by the fact that, as you can see, my supper's not in the lunchbox, and I really am quite, quite, quite uh, upset about that. But uh, it would appear that uh, my wife has left me a note in here, and I'm just going to have a look at it. Okay, 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 okay. Right. Okay, <laughs> 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 right. Dear Paul, Madam Mayor, good start. So your lunchbox is empty, but the main man in my life, Leo the Lizard, we don't have a lizard, was hungry last night and he's had yours. <laughs> so I am. Outraged that the other lizard has taken advantage over me. If the week takes a long time and you do go hungry, can you ask that really nice man, Graham, if he's has anything left in his own lunchbox? Pringles. Oh, I like Pringles. I don't like Pringles. Anyway, I have closed it. I have closed a McDonald's voucher just in case. Ah, oh, nice. Right, Big Mac sandwich, it's Big Mac or Chicken Mac sandwich, or whatever it is, a medium fries for one ninety nine. No advertising. Oh, the fast food. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> right, by the mayor, it's expired. So I'm again outraged. Outraged by the mayor. Right, okay. See you after midnight when the meeting is finished. Well, let's hope it finishes before midnight. Love, Dawn. Okay. Uh, uh, Madam Mayor, there's, there's, there's another note in here. Uh, and it's a piece of correspondence from, from a consumer uh, within the city. We've heard of letters to the Echo. Uh, this is letters to the Cabinet Secretary. And it's from, let's call her Sue. And she's an ex Liberal Democrat voter from Grindon Ward. From, from Sandy, sorry. <laughs> She says that she's outraged, Madam Mayor, outraged at this silly motion that it distracts from the real issues facing local people within the city. She, she's outraged, Madam Mayor, that the local Liberal Democrat councillors refuse to condone their own national leadership who orchestrated the public sector cuts that we are facing and with their Tory friends. And Madam Mayor, uh, I'll give some, uh, an answer back to Sue, call her Sue, in relation to the impact uh, on the council by the work done by their national party, Vince Cable and Company, while they were uh, in the same bed with the most right-wing government uh, this uh, 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 country has seen in living memory. <laughs> Madam Mayor, we've got a Budget deficit, sorry, a budget gap of 293 million, uh, 293.9 million by the end uh, of, uh, of March. 
There's going to be another £25 million of cuts last year. It's all down to them because they start with the ball rolling, getting into yeah. bed with their party nationally back in 2010. But the Mayor, the Deputy, the deputy Leader referenced the city, the Centre of Cities report, and he's quite right, with 17th worst affected city in the country with regards to austerity down to the Liberal Democrats. I don't blame the Tories. Well, actually, I do blame the Tories, but not as much as you. Because at the end of the day, you're supposed to be a so-called left of centre party, but you were quite happily went to bed with the right-wing Tory government and were quite happy to see cuts on local services and local people. And I just wait for you, I wait for you, you should have, you should have the honesty to see our government, our party nationally gone and wrong. Okay. Yeah. Okay, there's no talk about them unless the authority programme and the two and a half thousand jobs that's been lost in this council. And that's two and a half thousand families, Madam Mayor. They're silent on that. They'd rather talk about lunch boxes, the job cuts imposed because of their uh, coalition government. Madam Mayor, if we come back to Sue. Okay, what else did she say? Okay, she says she's. Yep, she's outraged again, Madam oh. Mayor. She's outraged again. Because the, the Liberal Democrat councillors, Liberal Democrat councillors, are refusing to condemn other Liberal, Liberal Democrats and other Liberal Democrat councils, actually, that they control, uh -huh. who also provide food at council meetings. Uh -huh. Really? Uh -huh. Really? Uh -huh. Really? Uh -huh. Yes. So, I mean, Madam Mayor, that will some of them. Yes, I I have to admit, and some of them, quite a lot of them, I've never heard of, and obviously. But you're talking about Bedford, Eastbourne, South Somerset, Sutton, Watford, to name a few, South Cambridge, and it goes on. Have similar systems to this authority, and I don't hear you condemning the, the, the Liberal Democrat leaders. In fact, I'm grateful if Nile does condemn the Liberal Democrat leaders, I will tell our Labour friends about that. Thank you, Madam. So, if we go on, we continue this. We continue this. Right. She's outraged, Madam Mayor. She's also outraged about the fact that the Liberal Democrat councillors refuse to take responsibility for the impact of their study programme on child poverty in this city, Madam Mayor. They'd rather talk about a lunchbox than they would about child poverty. <laughs> Madam Mayor, well, stick to the motion, please, Councillor Stewart. Madam Mayor, in 2010, before this lot went into bed with the right wing Tories, there was no food banks in this city in 2010. Madam Mayor, we now have 13 having to feed people because they can't afford to get food themselves. Now, their responsibility, they were in government with their lot, Madam Mayor. <laughs> <laughs> Madam Mayor, child poverty in this city is an issue and a problem and it needs to be recognised. And what I would remind them, and I would remind them of this, is that they are councillors, they represent individuals in their in their wards. And I'll just give give a two give two examples here. Pallion, child poverty rate there is 39.25%. Sand Hill is 37. Again, Councillor Stewart, Councillor Stewart, stick, stick to the motion, please. Apologies, Madam Mayor. Okay. Madam Mayor, in relation to, 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 to uh, the motion, what I would say is, and again, it's about the attitude of that group of Liberal Democrats and others in relation to, to, to child poverty. But I would say this, and I'll just say this again, I have another note, by the way, uh, and it says this, is that uh, a certain councillor Appleby, while we've been having this uh, meeting tonight, has been on Facebook and put a screenshot that states, don't, don't breed them if you can't feed them. So I don't know if you want Move the vote on the map. Thank you very much indeed.
think we'll now move on to Councillor McLennan, please. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I think I'm the cabaret. Could the desk please reset the timer? Thank you. Could you reset the timer? Thank you. It's not when you keep buttering and whistling behind me. Okay, yes, I'm going to take the, um, the assumption that I'm the cabaret, so tonight I'm speaking to you with the helpful assistance of my beautiful colleague who will assist me in this, this, this activity. Madam Mayor, thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. Colleagues, I rise tonight to speak against this motion. Firstly, I must say I am outraged at the implication made by the Lib Dems in this motion, specifically that I and my colleagues are picking it. Yeah. It's yeah. particular mention to, by, from one of my colleagues, Nia May, who is very distressed at the idea of you implying that she lives in a pigsty. Yeah. It's not funny. It's not funny. It's funny. I am outraged that the Lib Dems would bring this council into such disrepute by repeating the rubbishing lies created in the political gutter and already force-fed to residents through their mass leafleting of offensive material. Their yeah, action yeah. is the politics of the pig side. It is also potentially breaching child protection. On the inside of this outraged leaflet, there's a reference to what you should do with if a Labour calls. That was read out to a parent by a six-year-old. Yeah. Do you think that's right? I certainly don't. I am equally outraged that you think you can think of nothing more important. That you can think of nothing more important to debate than this twice. Stop sticking to the motion. When this is getting ridiculous, it's getting ridiculous. She is now. She is now. Councillor Ryan. She's not sticking to the motion. She is now. Councillor I am equally outraged that you can think of nothing more important to debate than this twaddle when the council has been stripped financially to the bone and um, faced, it's faced with nine years of austerity imposed on us by the Tory Liberal Democrat government. We are now using the city's bone marrow to keep services going. We should be debating the impact of austerity, unemployment, growing housing waiting lists, the plethora of unscrupulous landlords renting substandard properties to the most vulnerable, not pie and chips. Finally, I am outraged that you think the residents in this city will believe the lies and muck you are spreading. You would work well as muckrakers on a local farm. Voters are sick to death of your repeated reference to the issue of post-full council me meeting meals. You are clearly a one-trick pony and <clears throat> are not even honest enough to explain to the residents that the meals you are referring to are served up, served up to eight times a year, only at full council meetings. Excuse me? Can you just wait till I'm finished? Thank you. It is time to put your phony pony out to pasture once and for <laughs> The reality is it is cheaper to provide a meal after full council meetings than it is to process and pay out up to 75 meal allowance claims for council members, each at £10.60p. I said, give any money. No, don't. Can you just let me finish? Thank you, councillor. A payment, I must point out, that councillors are entitled to claim by national guidelines, not local preference. In the last few years, this council has learned how to maximise the spending impact of smaller and smaller amounts of cash, thanks to the callous and immoral acts committed by the Tories, Lib Dems and their well-to-do foie gras and caviar-eating friends in the financial world, the bankers. No pack lunches for them. From their swamp, these money-grabbing parasites. Excuse me, Councillor O'Neill. Excuse me, Madam Mayor. Councillor Sorry. It's so rare I see you. Councillor Bright, I had the courtesy to be quiet when you were ranting and talking. So would you please do the same to me? Thank you. From their swamp, these money-grabbing parasites who claim the country without casting a second glance at the people who are suffering because
because of their greed and profligacy. Nevertheless, the council is excellent at getting the best value possible for money spent, using resources and staff for more than one task. The Paul's Force Full Council Mill serves several purposes. It saves the council money compared with the potential bill from legal meal from legally legal meal substance claims. It provides vital basic sustenance for those who are so dedicated to their council duties, aka council steward, as I explained, aka councillor Morty, he's always here. I get emails at 3 o'clock in the morning of him. Right, <laughs> who are so dedicated to council duties that they don't have the time to go home for a meal or call in at the calf. Many members hold down jobs full and part time, including yourself. I think you work, don't you? Preventing them from the luxury of coming off the treadmill and calling home for food in between finishing work and stand attending council meetings. And before members on the other side demand that we should only have full-time councillors, I'd like to note that the life experiences and professional knowledge and insight these councillors provide these councillors provide adds additional quality and depth to the council's work in this city. These meetings are long and intense as we try to diminish and, and diminish the rubbish and false statements that you say. Right? If you want to reduce the, the, the time spent on the meetings and the need for a meal, might I suggest that you stop wasting our time on stupid motions like this one? and pathetic questions. Yeah. Yeah. In the interest of fairness and transparency, I am speaking on behalf of the majority party tonight to offer, not an olive branch, but a garlic bulb to our <laughs> colleagues in the minority opposition seats. I am therefore proud to unveil from Rob <laughs> the first trial sample of the City of Sunderland's Happy Meal Deal, a packed lunch posh. We have decided to allow Councillor Hodson and his fellow Lib Dems to sample them and feed back to us their thoughts. We are sure the Happy Meal deals will satisfy their hunger and help them make the switch to a diet of facts, not lies, in the and downright slanderous rubbish, which they have been force feeding the residents in the city. I am hoping to secure some cross-party support here in order to distribute the first samples to the six Liberal Democrats here tonight. I'll use you, Joe, if you don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, for everyone here, I'll briefly outline the contents of our trial Happy Meal deals. An eat-on-the-go ready meal for your of, of premier meat, various flavours, um, for the people in your category. What? <laughs> My, uh, people who are... <laughs> sorry? your muggies. Um, water to wash out the opposition's minds and mouths when they are considering resorting to gutter politics. The bottle can of course be reused and should last until May when we hopefully part company with you all. <laughs> a voucher for a free meal at one of the city's soup kitchens or free lunch clubs. They should find one in all areas of the city. They are increasing in numbers because the Tories and the Lib Dems continue to claim that restority is needed, regardless of the impact on people's ability to feed themselves and their families, and not to resort to feeding themselves cat food. A protein bar to increase your energy levels so that they are able to do your job properly, representing their electorate instead of using their mendacity to gain cheap headlines. All the best Happy Meals to have a toy to amuse the person. <laughs> because our Liberal Democrat guinea pigs are nothing more than troublesome children regurgitating rubbish in their words and actions, we put two gifts in to see them usefully occupied. The first is a model dinosaur, so that you can familiarise yourself with what your life would be like after me. <laughs> No yolk, but with a hidden surprise. 
The egg, this is again, we'll have to call it this one, okay? The egg has no yolk because this motion is no yolk. <laughs> <laughs> it, is an, it is an insult to the intelligence and common sense of residents in my city. Inside the eggs, they will find their new mascots. Fluffy, white, woolly sheep. Representing the brainless, brainless herd. They are and urged with the ability to ride on the back of Labour's achievement. Who seconds that lies in the this motion has no place in this debating chamber. I oppose it and express my disgust in the Liberal Democrats for attempting to discredit fellow councillors. My prediction on the chance of the motion being successful pigs my fly. Councillor? <laughs> Question be put, it should be seconded. If the Mayor believes the item has been sufficiently discussed, the procedural motion is put to the vote, and if passed, 
it, she will give the mover of the original motion a right of reply before putting the motion to the vote. Thank when you, I do, Madam Mayor, when I move the vote, that deprives him of that right to reply. No, I'm sorry, we've made the decision. Councillor Hudson does have the right of reply. Come on, speak, Councillor Hudson. <laughs> if there's anything left to say. Thank you, Mr. I have no further comments to add. <laughs> Madam Mayor, there are 13 votes in favour, one abstention, 46 votes against, and therefore the motion is defeated. Thank you all very much indeed. The next item tonight is reports, which includes a report of the leader on special urgency decisions, a report to declare a vacancy in Washington South Ward, together with a report on appointments to committees and outside bodies. We'll take these in turn, starting with the leader's report on special urgency decisions. Leader, would you move the report? I move the report, Madam Mayor. There have been no such instances since the last report. Deputy Leader, do you need to second that? I'll the report, Madam Mayor. Does the Council agree to receive the report? Agreed. Next, we'll deal with the report on the vacancy in Washington South Ward. Leader, do you wish to move the report? I move the report, Madam Mayor, as laid out. Deputy Leader, do you wish to second the report? I second the report, Madam Mayor. Do we declare the seat in Washington South Ward to be vacant? We do. Agreed. Finally, we'll deal with the report on appointments to outside committees and outside bodies. Leader, would you please move the report? Thank you, Madam Mayor. I move the report as laid out. Deputy Leader, do you second the report? Seconded. Leader, do you wish to speak to the report? No, Madam Mayor, I believe it's fully laid out. Deputy Leader, do you wish to speak to the report? No, thank you, Madam Mayor. Is the report agreed? Agreed. 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 And that concludes the meeting. Thank you all very much.